Hey there aspiring engineers, developers, data scientists and tech enthusiasts, uh, we warmly welcome each of you to a transformative journey that will unlock the full potential of Python. So we have divided this course into 11 sections and first one we'll have the introduction and then we'll have the 10 projects for you. So first project will be based on facial recognition and the second one we have will be of password generator. And then we'll see how you can retrieve data with CoinMarketCap API. So this will be a very interesting project. Then we'll also create a web scrapping bot using Python. And then uh, the next project is going to be data analysis. We'll do that with the help of Panas. And then we'll see how you can implement uh, automated weather forecasting. And then we'll also generate a conversational AI chatbot. And yeah, last two to three projects, we'll be building video summarizer with ChatGPT. And yeah, uh, so our second last project will be building a text to image uh, using Dell E. And the last project is basically we will uh, discuss some of the ways to automate your daily tasks using Python script. Hey everyone, welcome to our first project of this amazing course, Master Python through the creation of 10 unique projects. So in this video, I will guide you through the fundamental steps to create a face detection project using Python. So yeah, without further ado, let's just get started. So yeah, uh, first let's understand what face detection is and why it's important. Uh, basically, face detection is a computer technology that identifies and locates human faces and images or videos. So it is uh, basically a wide range of applications from all of that security system to social media filters as well. Okay, so now if you move further and see the steps of building a face detection project. So first of all, you need to collect data and pre-processing in which you will collect a diverse data set of facial images, process the images and label the images. So our second step is feature extraction. So you will extract meaningful features from the pre-processed facial images. Third one we have is model training. So we'll train a machine learning model using the extracted features and labeled data. Fourth one we have is model evaluation and hyperparameter tuning in which you'll evaluate the trained model's performance using metrics such as you know accuracy precision recall and fn score as well and the last step is deployment and integration so in this step you'll basically deploy the trained model in a real time or batch processing environment you know depending upon the application requirements so yeah uh, these are basically the basics of building a face detection project using python and in this project you'll see the entire working like what are the steps involved in building a successful face detection project so yeah stick around and i'll see you in the upcoming video until then take care bye bye all right so before starting the facial recognition project so these are basically the steps that will be involved in your project so first step is importing open cv or cv2 library uh so the question arises like what is cv2 library in this project that is really important so cv2 is basically the module import name for open cv python so what does it actually do so it basically allows you to perform image processing and computer vision tasks you know all those projects that involve like facial recognition and image processing so that gets done with the help of a open cv or cv2 library okay so uh, for this particular facial recognition projects open cv or cv2 library is a must in this case okay so that's why we have used that and our step two is going to be loading the hard case classifier this is also one another important library uh, for image processing and facial recognition projects then step three is going to be reading and pre-processing the image then we'll move to our step four which will be the reading the input image so we'll do all that code that will help us to read the particular input image then our step five is going to be face detection and drawing rectangles around faces so this will be the step five you know after we are done with all the face detection everything so now we need a proof we need something that will show like is it acting our face successfully or not so for that we'll draw rectangles around the faces and our last step will be displaying the resulting image and closing the window so that is also really important as well so yeah and now let's just go ahead and jump right into our code all right, so here I am with my Visual Studio Code open. So over here, uh, it's totally up to you. You can use any tool or any compiler. You can use a Visual Studio Code. You can use PyCharm. It's really up to you. Uh, but for myself, I'll be using Visual Studio Code because I found it the most convenient for me. So yeah, uh, first of all, you need to create a new file. I'm just going to go ahead and create a new file. It will be uh, the Python file, okay? And then we'll start writing the code right away. Okay, so first of all, what you want to need to do, you need to basically import OpenCV or CV2 library, right? So I'm just going to 
go ahead and write import cv2 right here okay so uh why is open cv2 important because obviously as you guys have seen in the previous video this line basically imports the open cv library which is really a popular open source computer vision and also a machine learning software library so in short if we say it's basically uh used for various image processing tasks okay so for image and video kind of projects, OpenCV or CV2 library is always a must. And now uh, we'll come to our second step, which is loading the hard cascade classifier. Okay, so that is also uh, another really important thing. So first of all, let's just write the code. I'm going to type here base. Okay, so this is another a really important step. So this particular line of code uh, basically initializes a cascade classifier with the XML file. Okay, as you guys can see right over here. So uh, this file basically contains pre-trained models for detecting frontal faces using that uh, hard cascade algorithm as you guys can see over here. Okay, let me just rectify this quickly. All right, so, uh, you know, whenever you are dealing with any image or video kind of a thing, uh, let's just say in our case, we are working on a project that will be detecting faces on particular images. So for that, uh, the import CV2 library, as well as the cascade classifier with XML file is really, really important. Okay, so these are basically the basics you can say, okay? So now uh, we'll move to our next step, which is reading uh, the input image. So now the step comes when you provide your code, the image that you'll be working on, okay? So you provide the image and in that, our whole code that will be writing with time, it will detect phase on that image. So for that, I'm just gonna write a code here, which is cap equal to cv2 dot video capture. Okay, here it is. And in parameter, I'm gonna take a file uh, let's just say I'm going to take elon.jpg. Uh, okay, let, let me just put this in comas. Okay, so why I put elon.jpg? Because obviously I have taken two, three photos, uh, two, three JPG images, which I have already put it in my folder over here, which is multi uh, image detector. I've put it a photo in my VS Code, I have imported two to three images over here. So now you can choose any images between them. I can simply go ahead and put one. I can simply go ahead and put two over here. It totally depends on you. You can uh, import as many images as you want in your folders. So for that, if I can tell you quickly, it's really important. Let's just say I go to my file over here, folder over here, if I want to choose this image, particular image. So I can simply click it and just drag it to my folder. And I have this image with me right away. Okay, so this is really important. So now, yeah, let's just quickly uh, go back to our code. And our next step is going to be, we'll be reading and processing the image. Okay, okay. so now the image has been imported. All the working has done. We have imported the library. So now what we need to do, we need to basically write a code that will process and read that particular image. Okay, it will read uh, the whole structure, the face, and it will tell us or detect like the face on that. Okay, so for that, what type or what code you're going to write? Let's just quickly see that. Okay, so first of all, we're going to write ret comas image so we'll take image in that and that will be equal to cap dot read so let me just quickly tell you what this is all about so uh this line basically reads a frame from video capture object okay so the image will provide this will basically read the frame from that uh you know uh from that image object and that will store it into the variable image okay so image is equal to cap dot read so that will basically read all the details and it will store that into our image and right over here, this is just a Boolean value or Boolean expression that will, you know, indicate like whether our operation was successful or not. So this is just kind of a confirmation um, expression, okay? So this is basically our main function. It will take image and it will it, that will be equal to cap dot read. So this particular variable will read all the details on our image, okay? So now comes the gray scaling part. That is really important concept for you guys to uh, understand. Let me just quickly write that first of all. We'll type gray equal to cv2 dot cvt color and in parameter we take image dot cv2 dot color again underscore bgr2 gray okay so now what is the purpose of that so this line basically will convert the image from color to grayscale okay so why need to convert the grayscale? Uh, because obviously we need to see all the dimensions, all the particular things. So with the help of a grayscale uh, process, it will help us to identify or, you know, recognize the face in that particular image. Okay. 
So that's why the grayscaling process is really important in this project. So grayscale images are basically, those are commonly used in computer vision tasks and that reduces the computational load. So that's why we need to first convert our colored image to a grayscale image. All right. Okay. So now the next step is basically to create a function, a detect multiscale function of the, you know, our cascade classifier that we just did earlier above. So now we create a main function that will help us to identify the face in the image okay so now comes the main part let's just quickly write the function then i'll explain to you guys okay so this particular function or a line of code uses that detect multi-scale method as you guys can see right over here so this is basically used uh, to detect faces in that grayscale image, okay? So as you guys can see now, the colored image has been converted to grayscale in this step. And in the next step, will basically be detecting the faces in that particular grayscale image. So that's why we have created a function for that. And you know, it basically uh, takes a grayscale image, a scaling factor of 1.3 and a minimum number of uh, the neighboring zones to be considered face, which is actually five in this case, okay? So these are the dimensions that we take for our a particular image. So now what is the next step? The next step is basically, uh, okay, so everything has been detected, our face is detected. So now it is really important for a project uh, to show us like it has detected that particular face. So how is gonna do that? We'll basically draw a border around the face showing that, you know, it has detected that face for us, okay? So how we'll do that? Uh, so we'll basically draw the rectangles around the face, okay? So for that, uh, we'll be applying four loops. So let me just quickly write the code for you guys, first of all. will basically I trade over the detected faces and I will uh, draw the rectangles around them using the cv2 dot rectangle function as you guys can see over here so we'll draw a rectangle a border around the face so yeah uh, now let's move to our next step which will be of uh, displaying the resulting image okay so let's just quickly write the code for that Okay, so after this step, we have displayed the image. So now, well, we need to close the image, okay? So for that, we'll write a code cap.release. So with this, uh, it will basically help us to close our image for us. So cap.release. And finally, we'll write cv2. Destroy all windows, okay? So this will basically deallocate any associated memory usage, okay? So destroy all windows. We take empty parameters now. Okay, so now our code has been completed. So now let's just go ahead and run this code and see whether it's gonna work for us or not. So I'm just gonna go ahead and save this file first of all. I'm gonna hit Control S, and let's just quickly rename this as Base Detection Project. Okay, our file has been saved. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and press F5 to run this. Okay, yeah, so as you guys can see, it's working for us absolutely fine. So as you guys saw, we took uh, Elon in that as our image and it was able to recognize the face of Elon Musk in this image successfully. So it drew a rectangular kind of a border around his face. So yeah, that's working absolutely fine. So if we can go ahead and change the image for us, okay? So let's just go ahead and go for uh, this image, Usman or JPG. Let me just go for that. This is actually my image. So if I go ahead and run this code, so now it will detect the face of this particular image, which is which is doing absolutely perfect. So this was basically a quick tutorial of how you can build a face detection project using very simple lines of code. Uh, this is basically a really simple method. Uh, there are actually a four to five steps involved in that, which I discussed with you guys in this video. So yeah, I hope you like this project and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. All right, guys, so here I am with my Visual Studio code open. All right, to create a password generator project, so we need certain steps so that I will be explaining to you throughout this video. So yeah, first of all, let's just not waste any time. Let's just create a new file. Uh, we'll create a Python file, of course. And yeah, first of all, so the very first step of for creating a password generator project is to import necessary tools. So first of all, we need to import random and we need to import string, okay? Let's just do that first. Okay, so here I have imported random and spring over here. So why I would do that? Because obviously I will bringing in some tools that will help us to generate password. 
So random over here, like random variable is used for generating random choices. Okay. So like whenever we are into like password generator or any project that in which we have to create like random characters, numbers or alphabets. So for that random library is always important. And next uh, we'll be using string library as well for, you know, accessing all those letter numbers and special characters that we'll be using throughout this project. Okay. So our second step is to define a function. So we'll obviously define a password generator function. So let me just do that first of all. Okay, so our uh, function has been defined, which is named as password generator. So now what's our third step? So our third step is to create the list of characters. So obviously, as you guys know, like by creating a strong, unique password, we need like three to four things, right? We need numbers, we need letters, we need special characters, right? So all that mixture of those things will create a strong, unique password that we require. Okay, so we'll obviously list down those three things. So first of all, I'm just going to write here letters equal to list. So we'll take a list and in parameter, we'll have string dot ASCI underscore letters, okay? All right, so this is our uh, first list. So our second list will be numbers, of course. So we'll take numbers equal to list again. And in parameter, we take string and uh, that will be dot digits, okay? So obviously we need digits for that. It's really simple. So now the third thing we need is special character. So that is really, really important as well. So that will basically help our password to be a strong and unique one, okay? So we'll take list, parameter, we'll take string dot punctuation, okay? So we'll take punctuation marks as well. So that's why I've written punctuation over here. Okay, so now let's just move to our fourth step. So now what we have to do, uh, we have list, we have numbers, we have, we have characters, right? So now we have to create a function uh, that will combine all those things in one string or in one list, okay? So what we have to do, we have to basically generate a function that will combine letters, numbers, as well as special characters, all that in one string, okay? So let's just do that. So we'll take function as all characters, okay? And that will be equal to these letters plus these numbers and plus these special characters, okay? Okay, so now this is done. So our fifth step is to create an empty password list. So this will be basically our library that will be storing our generated password. So whatever password it will generate that, it will store that in this empty library, all right? All right, so that we have done as well. So now let's move to our sixth step is basically generating the password. So now what our main function, or you can say the main procedure of the project will come. So now we'll uh, basically apply the for loop over here that will run 15 times in each iteration we'll be picking a random character from all the characters list and you know adding to our password list so let's just do that for i'm gonna go ahead and apply for loop for i in range and in parameter we take 0 comma 15 so obviously i need my loop to run at least 15 times okay so i want like 15 unique passwords from my um project every time i run it okay so that's why i put 15 over here and that will be uh, equal to password dot append so we'll take append variable over here and in parameter we'll take a random dot choice and in that parameter we'll take all characters okay so this was basically our function all character which was equal to letter number special character we'll take all characters in this parameter such so that you know it utilizes all those things in our for loop got it okay let's just put that now all characters over here got it Okay, so now let's just move to our seven steps. So obviously, we have to return the password. So our seven step will be re to return the password. Sorry. All right, it is done. And obviously, what will be our last step? Our last step is going to be training that generated password. So we'll take a print function over here. In parameter, we'll take password generator, okay? Here it is. And we'll have empty parameters in that, all right? Okay, so our uh, code has been completed for our password generator project. So now let's just go ahead and save this file first of all. Uh, we'll import that as password generator. Okay, we'll save that. And now let's just go ahead and try to run this code and see the output of this. 
All right, yes, yeah, so as you guys can see, it has created the password for me. So first of all, it has taken comma, then P, then four, then Z, then it has taken square bracket, SQ, and if I go ahead and run this, you know, like multiple times, so every time it will give me a strong, unique password, okay? So this password is basically different from this one, okay? So you can clearly see that if I go ahead and run that again and again and again. So yeah, every time, as you guys can see, is creating a strong, unique password for me, right? So we have W, hash, plus, and F, D, Z, slash, plus, J, and this has like bracket, A, O, R, 1, G, star, L, semicolon, W. So yeah, every time it's creating basically the unique password for me. So I can run this uh, like Lou for 15 maximum times. If you want, you can simply change that to like as many times, or if you want, you can change that to infinity as well. It's totally up to you, but for this uh, particular case or project, I had limited that for 15 times. So 15 times, uh, basically you can uh, create strong, unique passwords. So how cool is that? Okay, so that was uh, basically it for our password generator project. I hope you liked it and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to our second project of this amazing course, Master Python through the creation of 10 unique projects. So in this video, I'll be discussing about the introduction to our password generator project. So let's just discuss like what is basically a password generator project. So a password generator project involves, you know, creating a software application or, you know, script that automatically generates strong, a random and secure passwords. So the purpose of this particular project is, you know, so that uh, it assists users in creating complex passwords, you know, that are really difficult to guess, such that it enhances the security of their online accounts or, you know, any sensitive information they're working on. So that is basically the purpose of this amazing project. So yeah, uh, this project will basically be based on few steps. So here are the steps uh, that will be involved in this password generator project. So, so the first step is gonna be importing random and strings. So we'll be importing random and string for the working of this project. And the second step will be defining the function. So after we have imported the string and random, so then we'll define a function which will be named as password generator. So our third step uh, is gonna be creating the list of characters, letters, numbers, and special characters. And our fourth step is going to be, we'll be combining all those three things into one list. Like we'll be combining all those characters in one list, uh, noting it down into one separate function. So our fifth step uh, is going to be creating an empty password list and generating password. And last step will obviously be returning and printing password. So yeah, uh, we'll see all that with the help of a Python project, like how we can implement that. So for that, I'll see you in my next video until then take care bye bye all right guys so here i am with my visual studio code open all right to create a password generator project so we need certain steps so that i will be explaining to you throughout this video so yeah first of all let's just not waste any time let's just create a new file uh, we'll create a python file of course and yeah first of all so the very first step of for creating a password generator project is to import necessary tools so first of all we need to import random and we need to import string okay let's just do that first okay so here i have imported random and string over here so why have we do that because obviously i will bringing in some tools that will help us to generate password so random over here, like random variable is used for generating random choices, okay? So like whenever we are into like password generator or any project that in which we have to create like random characters, numbers or alphabets. So for that random library is always important. And next uh, we'll be using string library as well for, you know, accessing all those letter numbers and special characters that we'll be using throughout this project, okay? So our second step is to define a function. So we'll obviously define a password generator function. So let me just do that first of all. Okay, so our uh, function has been defined, which is named as password generator. So now what's our third step? So our third step is to create the list of characters. So obviously, as you guys know, like by creating a strong, unique password, we need like three to four things, right? We need numbers, we need letters, we need special characters, right? So all that mixture of those things will create a strong, unique password that we require, okay? So we'll obviously list down those three things. So first of all, I'm just gonna write here letters equal to list. So we'll take a list and in parameter, we'll have string dot ASCI underscore letters, okay? All right, so this is our uh, first list. So our second list will be numbers, of course. So we'll take numbers equal to list again. And in parameter, we take string and uh, that will be dot digits, okay? So obviously we need digits for that. It's really simple. 
So now the third thing we need is a special corrector. So that is really, really important as well. So that will basically help our password to be a strong and unique one. Okay, so we'll take list parameter, we'll take string dot punctuation. Okay. So we'll take punctuation marks as well. So that's why we're in punctuation over here. Okay, so now let's just move to our fourth step. So now what we have to do, uh, we have list, we have numbers, we have, we have characters, right? So now we have to create a function uh, that will combine all those things in one string or in one list, okay? So what we have to do, we have to basically generate a function that will combine letters, numbers, as well as special characters, all that in one string, okay? So let's just do that. So we'll take a function as all characters, okay? And that will be equal to these letters plus these numbers and plus these special characters, okay? Okay, so now this is done. So our fifth step is to create an empty password list. So this will be basically our library that will be storing our generated password. So whatever password it will generate that, it will store that in this empty library, all right? All right, so that we have done as well. So now let's move to our sixth step is basically generating the password. So now what our main function, or you can say the main procedure of the project will come. So now we'll uh, basically apply the for loop over here that will run 15 times in each iteration. We'll be picking a random character from all the characters list and you know, adding to our password list. So let's just do that for, I'm gonna go ahead and apply for loop for i in range. And in parameter, we take zero comma 15. So obviously I need my loop to run at least 15 times. Okay, so I want like 15 unique passwords from my um, project every time I run it. Okay, so that's why I put 15 over here and that will be uh, equal to password dot append. So we'll take append variable over here and in parameter, we'll take a random dot choice and in that parameter, we'll take all characters, okay? So this was basically our function, all character, which was equal to letter, number, special character. We'll take all characters in this parameter so that, you know, it utilizes all those things in our for loop. Got it? Okay, let's just put that now. All characters over here. Got it. Okay, so now let's just move to our seven steps. Obviously, we have to return the password. So our seven step will be re to return the password. Sorry. All right, it is done. And obviously, what will be our last step? Our last step is gonna be training that generated password. So we'll take a print function over here. In parameter, we'll take password generator, okay? Here it is. And we'll have empty parameters in that, all right? Okay, so our uh, code has been completed for our password generator project. So now let's just go ahead and save this file first of all. Uh, we'll import that as password generator. Okay, we'll save that. And now let's just go ahead and try to run this code and see the output of this. All right, yes, so as you guys can see, it has created the password for me. So first of all, it has taken comma, then P, then four, then Z, then it has taken square bracket, SQ. And if I go ahead and run this, you know, like multiple times, so every time it will give me a strong, unique password. Okay, so this password is basically different from this one, okay? So you can clearly see that if I go ahead and run that again and again and again. So yeah, every time, as you guys can see, is creating a strong, unique password for me, right? So we have W hash plus N F D Z slash plus J. And this has like bracket A O R one G star L semicolon W. So yeah, every time it's creating basically the unique password for me. So I can run this. Uh, like Lou for 15 maximum times. If you want, you can simply change that to like as many times. Or if you want, you can change that to infinity as well. It's totally up to you. But for this uh, particular case or project, I have limited that for 15 times. So 15 times, uh, basically, you can uh, create strong, unique passwords. So how cool is that? Okay, so that was uh, basically it for our password generator project. I hope you liked it and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to our third exciting project where we're going to be delving into the world of cryptocurrency data and we're also going to learn like how to fetch it using Python. So yeah, uh, specifically, uh, we'll be using the Coin Market API to retrieve this data and create a useful Python project. So yeah, uh, first thing first, let's just understand the project's objectives and like what we want to achieve, you know, what we are aiming to achieve in this project. 
So our project has basically several key goals. First, uh, we want to understand the basics of cryptocurrency data and also its importance in the financial world. Next, we'll be learning how to use the coin market API to retrieve real-time cryptocurrency data. And also we'll be uh, processing and analyzing the obtained data to make it very useful for various applications. Along with that, we'll also be developing a Python script to automate data retrieval and analysis. And yeah, at the end, uh, we'll be gaining practical experience in working with APIs and handling data in Python. So yeah, uh, now to appreciate the significance of this project, it's really important to understand first of all, like what is a coin market API? So uh, if you can talk about coin market API, it is basically a powerhouse in the crypto world. Okay, so it's kind of a website which offers, you know, a vast array of cryptocurrency data ranging from all market caps and prices to, you know, uh, trading volumes and historical data. So it's really, uh, you know, an important, a useful tool for developers and enthusiasts. It's basically, you can say, a treasure trove of information, okay, uh, that can be integrated into various applications like of your desire or whatever you want. So yeah, uh, if you can go ahead and see the purpose of our amazing Python project. So our projects will serve several purposes. Uh, so it is designed to demonstrate how to interact with the coin market API using Python and also fetch valuable cryptocurrency data. This project will guide you through the process of analyzing and processing this data to extract meaningful insights and it will provide you a solid foundation for working with APIs and handling data in Python. So yeah, and now without further ado, let's just jump right into it and see the whole working of this amazing project. All right, guys, welcome back to this amazing project. So in this video, we'll actually be doing all the process of, you know, like how you can uh, fetch data from API, how you can use that and how you can, you know, uh, just build an amazing Python project, getting the data of your design coins in the API market. So let's just dive deep into that. All right. So before starting, it's really uh, important to understand like what API is like, what it is used for, right? So if you can see right here, an API or you can say application programming interface is basically a server that you can use to retrieve and send data to using code. So yeah, APIs are most commonly used to retrieve data and they'll be the focus of this beginner tutorial. So uh, let's just say whenever you want to uh, receive data from API, you need to make a request. So APIs basically are used so you can send data, like retrieve data or receive or anything like that through your code, okay? So this is basically a kind of a source through which you can send data, you can receive data and all that good stuff, you know, in your Python Go. So that's what uh, we're going to use API for. Okay, so now let's just uh, start with our project. So let's just see how we can do all that. Okay, so first of all, uh, we're going to start by going to our API coin market uh, website. So this is the link for that. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this, uh, paste it right over here. So yeah, uh, as soon as I need the coin market API, so obviously uh, we need the API key for that, right? So how we can achieve that, I'll show you in a minute. So as you guys can see uh, right over here for, uh, through this chunk of code, so it's saying like this API key is invalid because this was uh, the API key in our link so this is basically you know the use one or this is not valid anymore so we have to change that and we have to basically create a new one of us so let's just do that real quickly okay so for that i'm just gonna go ahead and go and go to coinmarketcap.com uh, so this is basically the interface of this coin market cap website so first of all basically you need to create your account okay i've already created my one you can simply do that it's really really simple let me show you in a minute so you just need to hit sign up on this button. So then you have three to four options. Either you can continue with Google, Apple, Binance, Wallet, like whatever you want. So I have uh, created my account with Google. So I'm just going to go ahead and log in right here. Okay, so after that, as you guys can see, my account has been logged in. So now this is basically the interface. So as you guys can see, we have all the coins right here. First one is Bitcoin, then Ethereum. Then you have Tatsuri, BNB, XRP. So these are all the coins over here, like whatever is available in the market, wherever it's trending right now. So as you guys can see, we have a lot of lists over here. So there are like almost uh, in total 2,500 uh, coins in the market. So next up, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to scroll right down to the bottom. And then you can see we have different options over here. So you need to go to the crypto API because obviously we need an API key, right? So in order to get this project started, so we need to click on that. And now uh, you will give you two more options. Either you want to get your API key now or compare API plans. So obviously, uh, we want to use the free version of this API. Obviously, there's a paid one as well, but you know, free is good. So you need to click on get your API key now. And you need to sign in again. Okay, let me just do that. Okay, it's already signed in. 
So now this is basically, uh, you know, the API key for you guys. So you can simply go ahead and copy that. So this API will basically give you a pretty uh, handsome amount of usage. So you can use that for 10,000 credits per month. So this is a pretty handsome amount. We just want to need this for uh, this project. So uh, I guess that won't be a problem. So, okay. Now let's just go ahead and copy this API keys. Copy it as you guys can see. And come back to our API coin market cap .com. So yeah, uh, as I told you guys earlier, this was the key that is going like it's invalid. So I need to change that to our new key with the coinmarketcap.com uh, just provided us, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and paste it right here. Hit enter. Okay, yeah. So now you guys can see this is giving me a, some kind of data. So if I tell you guys, this is basically the JSON format data. So you can see uh, we have like the ID one name as Bitcoin, right? Over. Let me just zoom in a bit. So we have name as bitcoin so the main problem of this data is like it's not readable right it's quite messy it's like quite merged up so this is what we call is json format data okay so now what we have to do we have to basically convert our json format data to some readable data right so we need to like beautify this data into some more like readable form where we can read that use that and you know in our uh, upcoming project so what we have to do now we have to basically convert the json format data to some readable form data right so for that it's really easy you can simply find a lot of tools online so if you can go ahead and simply write json formatter so you can find a lot of uh, tools online. So if I can go ahead and hit the second one. Okay. Yeah. So as you guys can see, it's showing me this. So if I can go ahead and come to my, uh, the same data, I can simply copy this whole, come to my JSON formatter, paste it right here. So yeah, as soon as I will uh, paste it, it will give me the readable form, right? So now you can see it's a lot cleaner and it's a lot readable, right? So now we have like stated, this is the, basically the main dictionary. Uh, then we have the data dictionary. So we have two dictionary over here, the status one and the data one. So our whole content are like our whole data will be in this data dictionary, right? So this is what we have. So in that uh, we have like ID one, which is Bitcoin. The symbol of that is BTC. The slug is Bitcoin. Then we have num uh, market pair, which is 10484. Then we have date added tags and all that good stuff. And then if you come to the second ID, we have Ethereum, we have symbol for that, so like num pair markers and everything like that. So now it's a lot readable, right? So now you guys must have been noticed it's only giving me like, you know, the status or the data of only two coins, right? So why is it so? Let me tell you guys. So if I can come back to my JSON format, you know, the link that I just provided to uh, the API coin market cap.com. So if you can see closely, uh, you can see we have cryptocurrency listing and then we have limit as well right so as you guys can see in this limit i provided it to give me like the status or data of only two coins like the two top coins right so that's why it was showing me uh the data or status of just two coins so we if you want we can change this up to like 5,000, 10, or whatever you want, like it's totally up to you. So let's just say for an example, if I change this to 10, right? So I want now uh, the 10 best coins on the market. I want the data of those. So if I can go ahead and hit enter. So now you guys can see it's uh, again the JSON format. So no problem. We can always change that to, uh, you know, the more readable one. So let me just go ahead and copy this, come back to where JSON formatter paste it right here so yeah and now you guys can see now we have like id one then we have the second id over here then we have the third id over here so it's all the way up to the 10th id right so now we have 10 top points uh for us on the market right now so in this way uh you can easily change the limit to whatever you want you can change that to 20 30 40 100 like it's totally up to you right so this will uh, basically help us to modify our project according to our need right so this is really really uh, important as well and if you can see closely right beside the limit we have the start option as well so you can start from one two so you can change that uh, to as well according to your needs so this is the start one this is the limit then we have convert to sd to like whatever uh, you want to do that you can change that according to your preference as well then we have api key which i just told you guys earlier okay so this was basically uh the kind of uh, you know of working on how you can get a raw uh, data how you can convert that json format data into a readable one and how you can you know use that further in your project so in the next video i'll be telling you you know how you can create a project where you can uh, take the input from the user and you can find uh, any coin on the market you just need to type the symbol for that and it will tell you the online price the online status and everything about that particular coin so i'll see you in the next video until then take care bye bye
All right, guys, welcome back. So in this video, I will actually write a Python script that, you know, retrieves the latest cryptocurrency price information from the coin market cap API. And after that, then it allows the user to input a cryptocurrency symbol to, you know, get the price of their specific cryptocurrency in USD. So let's just say uh, you want to create an app. So, you know, that basically tells all the top, uh, you know, coins that are available in the market. And you want to basically know the price of that coin. Uh, you need to enter the symbol of that coin and that will basically tell you the status and price of that particular coin so let's just say you want to create that applications at uh, that project so let's just see how we can do that so in the previous video you saw like you know how we can uh, get like JSON formatted data how we can beautify that and how we can change that according to like you know the start and limit so I told you all that procedure so now uh, you know continuing that so let's just write code you know that will take all that information and that information we can basically uh, modify that and change it according to our preference and how you can you know utilize that to make such apps so let's just see that okay uh, so for that I'm just gonna go ahead and come to my uh, visual studio code I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new file select language as Python of course and yeah uh, so now let's just get this course started. Okay, so first of all, uh, in this type of project, it's really important to import one library that is request. So why we need to import library that is request? Because obviously we're using APIs in this project, right? So APIs is kind of a tool I already told you guys, you know, for uh, retrieving or using data throughout the code. So as we are using APIs, so we need to import one library that is request. Okay, so my, I have already done that. So let's just say, uh, if you want to import uh, that library, if you want to download the library, you can simply go to google.com. So you can just simply, you know, pip install request, integrate that to your Visual Studio Core, whatever like tool you're working on. So it's really simple. It's just like, you know, a couple of seconds uh, procedure. So yeah, my I have already installed. So let's just uh, get back to our Visual Studio code. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna write here import request. All right, here it is. And the next uh, library I want to import is obviously what else we use uh, other than APIs. We use JSON, right? So I'm going to need to import JSON as well. So, okay, so as we have imported the libraries, so these library, uh, you know, you're going to use it to make HTTP request to coin market API. So as you guys can see, we had a link like HTTP link. So that you can, you know, uh, you know, use that to make coin market API requests. So for that, we have used the request library and the JSON library is basically used to work with JSON data. So as, as you guys know, like that was basically the JSON data, right? We only beautified it to, you know, make it more readable, but still that is a JSON data. So if you want to work with JSON data, so you need obviously to import the JSON library for that as well. So that's why we have imported these two libraries. So our next step is to make an API request, obviously, uh, because we are working with APIs. So let's just do that. I write here API underscore request. This is the name of our function that will be equal to our request. Here it is dot get so we obviously we're going to use the cat variable and in the parameter of that so now we're going to do what we're going to basically put that specific url or you know uh, that link that we're working on along with that api and everything okay so what was that link let's just quickly go back to our link so this was basically our link which had our limit uh, which had a starting point and which also had our api okay so i'm just going to go ahead and copy this link come back to my Visual Studio code and paste that link right over here inside the commas. All right, here it is. All right, so uh, we are done with that. Okay, so we have made an API request that will basically, you know, get that link and they will work on that. So our fourth step is going to be we need to uh, parse the API response. So now we have got the API link and everything. So we need to get the response of that as well, obviously. So what will be the use of that if we don't get the response? For that, we need to do a couple of initialization. First will be API underscore data equal to json oops json dot loads and in parameter we'll take api underscore request dot content okay so i'll tell you in a minute like what exactly we're doing over here first let me just write the code for you guys so our second initialization is going to be coin equal to input and in those parameter we'll uh you know just We'll print a statement that will take the input from the user. Okay. So as you guys can see where we have you taken API underscore data JSON dot loads API request dot content. So why we have taken that, that's really important. So we need to take the API data as well. So if you can go ahead and go to 
our JSON formatted, you know, that beautified um, content that we just converted. So as you guys can see in this raw data, we have two like libraries, like we have the library of status, and then we have the library of data, right? So if you want to work in data, because obviously on this project, we need to work in the whole of this data. So for that, first we need to access the status as well, right? So for that, we have taken like API data as you could just load API request dot content. So we have taken data first of all, and then we have taken input from the user. So you need to enter the uh, coin symbols or whatever the coin symbol, it will tell you that information, okay? So now let's come to our next step, which is going to be, we're going to create a loop through the cryptocurrency data. So we're going to basically I trade a loop like 500,000 times or how many times, whatever you want, it's totally up to you. Uh, you know, going through the data of different cryptocurrencies. So obviously in these type of questions, like whenever we are working with, you know, the whole a list of data. So obviously the loop is really, really important. So we'll be using loop over here, you know, in order to access between all those data and find the one that we are looking for, right? So uh, let me just quickly write the code for you guys, first of all. So we're going to write for i in range. And in parameter, you can take like 5,000 or like what, how many coins do you have? So let me just go ahead and, you know, go through all the coins. Let me just go ahead and write 2,500, let's just say. And the loop will be uh, equal to, we'll do if point equal, equal to API underscore data. So then it will say data and then it will come to I and after that it will come to symbol. All right, so after the for loop, I provided if a statement over here, okay? So if statement, it will basically check if the user's input matches a cryptocurrency symbol. So if you guys can see, like if I write it, if coin equal equal to API underscore data, then it will access through that data. So it will come to that I that is a variable that I provide in the loop, and then it will come to the symbol, okay? So yeah, uh, this line basically uh, will check like if uh, the user's input store in the coin variable will match as a symbol of the cryptocurrency at the current iteration I in the API data, okay? So this is what uh, this line of code is gonna do. So next, uh, if that will be true, it will print the price of our API data uh, and it will show the symbol in USD is so now we have taken the round variable over here why is that because you know uh, whatever value or whatever price after the point is going to be so you know that we want that in the power of three right so that's why we have taken round variable over here so then it will access through our API data it will go to the data then I in range then code USD in price and after that it will print uh, that particular price for that coin okay so yeah, now let's just go ahead and save this file, try to run this and see well, like, whether it's going to work or not. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and save this project as Coin Market API. Let's just go for that. Okay, it's saved now. And now I'm just going to go ahead and hit F5 to see the output of this. Okay, as you guys can see, first of all, it's uh, asking me to enter a coin symbol. So now comes a really important point. So as you guys saw over here, like in our loop, we have the range up to 2,500, okay? So if I can go ahead and come to my coin market, so as you guys can see over here, like we have all the coins over here. Like now we can access through all these coins, like up to 2,500, like how cool is that? And you can change it according to your need. So I can go ahead and, you know, just put the symbol, like, you know, after the name, we have BTC, ETH, USDTH, I can put the symbol and now I can check the price of any coin available in the market. So let's just say I want to check the price of this Solana, right? So I can go ahead and hit SOL. Let's just go for that. So let's just say I put the coin symbol over here as SOL. So I'm showing the price of SOL in USD is $24.109. So let me just go ahead and reconfirm this. So as you guys can see over here, this SOL price was 24.10. So I can go ahead and check any of that. Let me just go ahead and extend to my you know, go to like any coin in between like the six list. Let's just go for that. 
And now I want to check, uh, let's say GFT, okay? So let me just go ahead and try to run this again, okay? And over here, let's just say I put GFT. So, okay, so for that, it's clearly showing, you can see the price of GST in USD is 0.024, which was exactly our value over here, so 0.0239. So if you round that up, it will be 0.024, okay? So yeah, this is how we successfully uh, create a Python project that retrieves the latest cryptocurrency price information from the Coin Market API, and we can implement that with simple steps. It's really, really simple. Just you know, uh, you need to focus. You need to follow the steps that I told you guys in these videos. So yeah, I hope you uh, like this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care. Bye bye. So first of all, I will just give you a brief overview of our project. Okay. So we will be building a complete professional weather application by using the power of weather API, this thing right here, okay? So we will be working on our API calls and we will use open weather, weather API, this thing right over here, okay? And by using this API, we will be creating a weather application, okay? So now i will just give you a brief preview about our application so all right this is how our application will look like we will have two text boxes like we will enter the city one city two and we have a button to compare weather of both cities okay so so for instance if i enter the city one as vena and if i compare the weather you can see right here we can get the name of the city weather and for instance clear sky we have a logo five day forecast like thursday friday saturday sunday and monday okay so we can see different uh, like uh, different days weather like five days forecast actually okay we can see the temperature range as well our cast clouds or like what is the status so if i compare two cities like vena and if i say sydney okay and if I just uh, compare the weather, then it will show me the weather of two cities simultaneously. So you can see right here. So the for Sydney, it's starting from Friday because of the difference in time zone. Because in Sydney, it's already Friday. Okay. So that was the preview of our application. All right. So in this particular project, what we're really going to do is we will actually be integrating our uh, open weather API to actually create an application for us. Okay. So in this particular project, the more focus will be on the backend design actually. Like I will try to actually show you guys like how you can actually uh, integrate an API and actually do that functionality. Our focus won't be on designing the HTML or like styling of the pages. Uh, that actually, I, I assume you can uh, handle that that pretty much easily, okay? Because I assume you all are developers, actually. So we will be more focused on the backend design and the API management, actually, okay? So API stands for Application Programming Interface. So it is a set of rules and protocols for building and interacting with software applications. In essence, APIs allow different software systems to communicate with each other. They enable developers to use certain functionalities of other software components without having to understand the details of their internal working. We will be designing the complete backend in Django. It's another great Python uh, web programming framework. We will be using Django framework to actually build this complete application so we will be actually designing our complete backend using python's django framework so that was the overview video of our project so that marks the end of this video okay so this will be a step-by-step -step process so we will actually be seeing the actual working of our project in the next video till then have a good day bye all right guys okay so in the previous video we saw the project overview and we actually saw what we are going to create in this project okay so we will be creating a weather application so you saw in the previous video like we overviewed what our weather application will look like and we will be going to use this api okay this weather api so it's basically uh, 1000 API calls per day are for free. So that's really amazing. 
so we can get the current weather data hourly forecast for like four days and daily forecast 16 days okay and we can actually see the climatic forecast like 30 days we can actually bulk download and there are multiple options you can read the uh, documentation of this uh, api it's really amazing okay so in this video we will be setting up our project and we will actually see how to set a project structure okay so the first step we need to do is we need to actually sign up to get our api key so i'll just click sign up on this link so this is the sign up page so i'll create a new account i'll choose my username so this will be my username and this is my email and here i'll choose my password okay i need to repeat my password yeah i am 16 years and older agree with privacy policy just check all of these okay and click on i'm not a robot and this is a captcha i need to solve this thing and i will create an account okay oops it says that the password confirmation does not match so i'll try again i think that's fine now yeah traffic light okay so create account yeah and it says that how and where will you use your api okay so company i'll say skill curve and purpose is actually i'll just choose other and i'll just save okay now actually they have sent a confirmation link to my email address so i need to check my email so i'll open up a uh, tab here for gmail and i'll confirm my account okay so here it is you can see i will verify the email it's actually done okay so i'll close this thing close this as well and here is the section for api keys okay so you can see right here so i'll copy my api key right from here and i'll save this api key inside of a sticky note for now okay so here is my api key make sure you get your own api key because this won't be working because after this project is over i'll just delete my account okay so that's it for like uh, setting up the api key now we will set up the project structure okay so for that i'll just uh, head to my documents folder you can just go to anywhere you want okay so i'll just create a new folder and i will call it as weather underscore project okay so i'll open up my folder and i'll just type in cmd to open this folder inside of command prompt so here i am i'll just zoom in it a bit okay so here i will just type in code space dot to actually open this folder inside of vs code so it will open up vs code for me so you can see right here okay so now here what i need to do is i will just open up a new terminal okay so my tab 9 is working that's a uh, good news actually okay first of all i'll just install dependencies for my project i will just say pip install django and request okay we'll be using both of these so we need to install them okay so i'll just hit enter so it will take a while to install django and request module for me so for those who don't know what django is django is basically a web application framework of python so we'll be using that to build our application okay yeah it's done you can see right here okay so it was done i will just now close my terminal Django and requests are installed now okay okay so now I need to set up my project files okay so I will open up a new terminal again so here what I will do is I will say Django dash admin start project and I will call it as weather underscore project okay so i'll just hit enter and it will take a while to create a django project for me here you can see is the folder okay so here is my manage.py file which is actually required to do stuff and things okay so i'll just uh, cd into my weather underscore project now i am inside of my weather project folder and here what i will do is i will use python manage dot 
white and I'll say start app and I will call it as weather underscore app. Okay, so this will be our application where we will be uh, building our app. Okay, so you can see right here it has like admin.py file apps.py models.py test and views.py. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we need to move on to the settings.py file of our project okay so here inside of our installed apps what we need to do is we need to actually uh, initialize the weather underscore app this thing right here okay we need to initialize it here so that we can use our weather app okay so now what i will do is i'll just run to see whether my project is working or not i'll say python manage dot py run server okay so i do not have like uh, migrations applied so that's fine for now i'll just copy this link and i will just move on to my browser paste it here so yeah the install works successfully and it says congratulations okay so for now it's fine so i will just modify this thing to show you like how it will work okay so inside of my views.py of my weather app okay so here is where our backend goes okay so i will just define a new function called index and i will just provide a request here you can see it's providing me with a code snippet like return render request comma index.html so you see how like intelligent is tab 9 so now what i need to do is i will just create a new folder inside of my weather app and i will call it as templates and here what i will do is i will just create a new file i will call it as index.html and here i will give h1 tag and i say this is my web page okay i'll save this thing i'll save this thing as well and let's see whether actually we can see this thing on the screen okay actually we can't so what we need to do here is inside of templates we need to create a new folder which will be exactly the same name as the app name okay so i'll call it as weather underscore app and i will move my file inside of weather app okay so i'll just move it inside of my weather app here so now if i just save this thing and i think i have to provide the name of folder here as well like weather underscore app forward slash index.html this is how django works so if you want to know more about django you can read the official documentation that's really simple okay so i'll save this thing that's done now i need one more thing actually i need to create a new file inside of my weather app i'll just minimize this thing i'll just create a new file and i will call it as urls.py okay so inside of my urls.py i can actually copy all of this stuff from here yeah i can get rid of this admin thing right from here okay so now what i can say is like from dot import views okay actually i need to access this file inside of here okay so now i say if like my path is empty like this thing right here okay if it's empty it has nothing in front of it so i need to provide here like views dot index okay and i will name this thing as index okay so i think that's pretty much done okay and uh, now actually i need to provide the url of this thing this actually app inside of my settings url as well okay so here what i will do is from django urls i will import include okay so i will say if like path is empty okay if path is empty include weather app dot urls okay this thing right here weather underscore app dot urls it will just take everything from here okay so i'll just save this thing and i think that's pretty much done so now we should actually see 
this is my web page in h1 tag on my home page okay so actually if i reload this thing you can see right here it's up and running okay so that's amazing and awesome now we will see like how front end and back and communicate with each other okay so inside of my views.py this is where our back end goes okay so if i say for instance like name equals i'll provide my name okay so if i want to send this thing this thing right here okay to my front end actually okay here so how i will do that so the process is like we need to create a context dictionary so i'll say context equals i can create a key like name and pass in the variable here okay so now what i will do here is i can pass in the context equals and i can pass this thing right over here okay so now i can actually access this name at the front end okay so if i just save this thing if i come back to my index page i can now say like hello my name is i can call here name okay so if i save this thing i think that should work okay so now what it will do is it will say hello my name is and take the name from the back end okay so the purpose of showing you this thing is that you should be aware of the fact that how front end and back end communicates so whatever we will perform here we can send that thing to the front end this way okay so now if i open up my web page and if i reload so you can see right here i can see the thing that's coming from the back end so that was actually the purpose to show you this thing so now all of our files are set up we have our project configuration set up so that's it for this video actually okay so in the next video we will be actually implementing the api part here so that we can actually create our weather app okay so that's it for this video i hope you like this one thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day bye all right guys okay so as now our project structure is set up you can see right here that we set up the project structure in the previous video we also actually got our api key which is this thing right over here okay so now what we need to do is in this video we will see how to design backend by using the power of prompts okay so the focus of this project is actually to show you how to solve your problems by using prompts so this video will cover the backend okay so let's start this thing okay so you see right here that it says you have 18 unapplied migrations so it says your project may not work properly until you migrate so we need to run this thing right over here to get rid of this error actually or warning we can say so i'll just uh, exit my server by hitting Control c so i'll run this command like python manage.py migrate so it will perform the migrations for me and when i will run my server again then i can get rid of those warnings actually so that's good so the first step we need to do is we need to actually import the necessary modules yeah i will import uh, requests yeah this thing right here and i will then import date time because we will use date time actually okay so these are the uh, modules i need here okay so i'll get rid of this thing this thing as well you see it's currently giving me the suggestions but i do not need that thing for now okay so inside my views the first thing i need to do is i need to define the api key okay so i'll say define open weather map api key and urls for current weather and forecast apis okay so i'll just hit enter so you can see right here it is defining the api key so here i need to replace this key with my api key that i pasted inside of my sticky notes okay so it will come right over here yeah that's fine okay you see it just provided me with the code so yeah i just created a new api key from here you see right here so i need to replace this key with that one yeah you can see right here just replace this thing and actually i need to modify the url as well okay first i'll say https i'll get rid of f string okay so 
forecast yeah instead of london i will say it's something that we will take in as a parameter okay so i'll just remove the api key from here for now yeah i'll get rid of all of this thing from here and i will say one call latitude equals dash longitude equals dash exclude equals current minutely hourly alerts and app id okay so that's actually something when you will read the documentation of api you'll get to know in more detail so that's pretty much it okay so you see it's giving me the uh, suggestion as well so i won't take it for now so now i'll say handle post request okay so you see it's providing me with the information so why it's giving me city latitude and longitude because i have those things right here okay so it's taking actually from the user so i'll get rid of all of these things from here for now i'll say retrieve user input for the first city and i can say as well retrieve the user input for the second city if provided okay because second city won't be mandatory yeah you see it provided me with the code for the second city so i can modify this thing as well i can call it as city one and this thing as well city one so that's good actually we are taking the both of the inputs from user actually okay so it's giving me suggestions so i'll just ignore them for now so i'll say fetch the current weather and forecast for the first city so now what i will do here is first i will actually define the helper functions here okay so for that what i will do is i will just call and i will say actually like helper function to fetch current weather and forecast for a city so yeah it provided me with the snippet you can see right here so now i will say like fetch the current weather data for the city okay so it's giving me the response like request dot get current weather url dot format city comma api key and the data will be in json format okay so here after this thing i will say extract the latitude and longitude from the response so yeah it gave me the response you can see right here okay so now i actually need to modify this thing okay so i can actually say fetch the forecast for the city using its latitude and longitude yeah you can see response equals request dot get forecast url dot format latitude comma longitude comma api key and dot json so that's good so actually i don't need this thing so i'll say structure the current weather data so yeah this thing right here you can see from here actually what i'll say response name i'll just get rid of this thing and i can actually provide this thing right here okay i don't need country so actually i can get rid of this thing okay temperature is fine so i can get rid of all of these things i need description which will be this thing right here okay yeah i also need an icon so yeah this thing is good wait yeah response weather uh, index zero and icon okay so i'll come out of this thing here i will initialize an empty list for daily forecast okay so now i will say loop over the forecast data for next five days actually okay yeah you can see right here just provided me with a response and now what i will do here is i'll say return the current weather data and list of daily forecast so yeah the helper function is pretty much done you can see how powerful is tab 9 in this scenario okay so now here what i will do is so i'll say fetch the current weather and forecast for the first city using this function actually okay so i'll hit enter so yeah you see it gave me the the code snippet okay so instead of just current weather and daily forecast i'll call them as weather data one and daily forecast one okay so now here what i will do is i'll say if the city two is there fetch current weather and forecast for city two else set city 
to data to none okay if i hit enter yeah you can see right here if city 2 is present weather data 2 and daily forecast 2 will actually we will pass in city 2 api key current weather url and forecast weather url into this function okay and we will get the current weather and daily forecast from this function okay and if it's not so daily weather 2 equals none and daily forecast 2 equals none so that's actually the logic behind it so here actually we are left with a couple of steps now so if i get rid of this context okay so i can say yeah it's providing me with the context you can see right here okay so i'll just uh, give it a prompt to actually make it a bit more specific i'll say define the context for template including weather data and forecast for both cities okay so yeah you can see right here context equals weather data one daily forecast one weather data two and daily forecast two okay so i'll see if i need some more things right here or not so i will say here return the index template with the context okay so here it is i'll say return yeah the indentation issue was there so yeah that's good that's fine so for this one i will say render the index template without any context if the request method is not post so obviously if the method is not post we do not need any context okay yeah that's the one and i can get rid of this thing okay so yeah our back end is pretty much complete you can see how powerful is tab 9 actually you can provide it with prompts and it can give you a response in no time okay so what i will do here is i will just save my views.py file okay and if i go back to my terminal yeah new terminal let me see whether the previous one is working or not I'll just delete them and I will say python manage.py run server okay oops I think I am not inside of my project folder so I'll say cd weather underscore project okay so now I think this will work so yeah you see it's up and running it means that there are no actually like major errors in our file okay if there is something about logic it will tell us later on so if i will paste my link here so you can see actually i just created a basic uh, html file which we're going to discuss in the upcoming video which will be of the front end okay so this is my application let's see if uh, we get a response back okay so i'll say france for the first city and if i hit enter like compare weather so it should bring back a response like it's 26.99 degrees celsius in france and light rain so let's confirm it with google weather in france okay so yeah it's 26 it's cloudy and precipitation is like one person so it's light rain you can see right here for friday it says it will like be light rain for saturday as well so you can see right here sunday as well light train so it's cloudy so we can't say anything monday as well tuesday as well so it's actually the five day forecast okay so now i'll say like first city is france and the second one would be mumbai okay so if i just click on compare weather so it should bring back the response for both of the cities so this one is for mumbai and it's actually the same weather how could it be weather and yeah it's actually the same so it's raining in mumbai as well okay so overcast clouds and yeah it's a five day forecast you can see right here so let's try with something else i'll say islamabad and ahmedabad okay yeah islamabad it's 35 degrees celsius so overcast clouds friday there are chances of light rain okay let's see okay it's 36 almost so yeah it's approximately fine yeah slight chances of rain saturday it's actually moderate rain you can see right here sunday as well moderate rain monday heavy intensity rain okay 
so tuesday ahmedabad it's actually smoky like temperature is almost same so you can see our app is working but it's not looking really nice okay so in the next video i'll show you the basic html template so that if you want to create this app you can do it by yourself actually okay and uh, i will just try to implement some css to make it look good okay so that's it for this video i hope you like this one Thank you so much for watching and I shall catch you up in the next video. Till then, have a good day. Bye. All right. So I hope all of you are doing well. And this is actually the last video of our weather app project. Okay. So let me just run and see whether it's working fine or not. Okay. So I'll say Python manage dot py run server so in this video what we are going to do is we will be actually looking at the front end design and we will be actually styling our website to make it look better okay so if i hit enter here so you can see right here uh, this is the link to the website so yeah if i paste my link here so this is the like bare bone of my application it asks for two city for instance if i say london first city is London and the second city is for instance Birmingham okay so these are the two cities I want to compare weather for these two cities okay so if I click on compare weather you see it's working right here so yeah you can see London it says that 17.96 degrees Celsius and it's like light rain and this is the five day forecast like Friday moderate rain Saturday light rain Sunday light rain Monday, there will be scattered clouds, Tuesday, broken clouds, okay? So, Birmingham and London. Yeah, Birmingham is a bit hotter as compared to London. So, currently, it's broken clouds and five-day forecast. Yeah, Saturday, it will rain and that's it, okay? So, that's actually the application. So, it's working perfectly. We have made the connection with the API in the previous video. And we are getting back the response. So that's great. That's awesome. So now I will just take you to the front end. So yeah, this is our main logic. You can see right here. And these are our two uh, like HTML files. You can see right here. Okay. So this is the cityweather.html. And this thing is actually our index.html. This is the main file. Okay. So actually, in order to manage the HTML files inside of Django, you need something called as Jinja template. Okay. So first of all, there is a load static, which actually loads everything that's static, or we can say the CSS file that's static. The image is considered to be a static. So first of all, we need to write load static, then that same doc type HTML. And this is the title. And this is our form, this thing right over here, okay? This is the form. So it has CSRF token. So that's important to actually take the request, okay? So there are two input fields, enter city one and city two. And there is a submit button that says compare weather, this thing right over here, okay? So this is like, uh, there is a container and it says if weather data one, for instance, if I go back here, okay, inside of my views file. So what we send from here, weather data one, which is actually the data for actually uh, city one and weather data two is the data for city two. Okay, so that's the idea actually. Okay, so it says that inside of index template, if there is weather data. So this is how you write the if else statement inside of Jinja template. Okay inside of Django HTML. So it says if weather data one is present, so it will show this thing, okay? Like it will include another HTML file, which is cityweather.html with actually weather data, that is weather data one and daily forecast one. So what it will do here is it will just take the weather data one and daily forecast one to this thing right over here, okay? so. Inside of here, it says if there is weather data one, so it will actually, first of all, it will actually represent the city, then its temperature and degree Celsius because it's in Celsius. Okay. So if I show you again, this thing comes from here, weather data dot city and this thing temperature, it comes from here, weather data dot temperature degree Celsius and weather data dot description. So 
this thing light rain okay and if daily forecast is present so it will show a heading like five day forecast this thing this heading and now what it will do is because the forecast was actually a for loop for five days so we will actually implement a for loop inside of jinja template and actually the class name is forecast so it says forecast dot day first of all it will just represents the day this friday it's basically result of the loop okay so if i go back and then minimum temperature to maximum temperature this is a paragraph this thing right over here it shows the minimum and maximum temperature and then it shows forecast or description this thing right here like moderate rain and there is a logo okay forecast dot icon and same here as well image is like weather data dot icon which shows the current state icon okay so it's all coming from the api so you can see right here this icon right over here so same is the case if there is weather data too so it will extend this actually to the same file now with the weather data too as a daily forecast and daily forecast too okay so that's pretty much it for the front end like html design okay so inside of my html there is like mentioned a static uh, file of style.css but we haven't just created any file like style.css file okay so what i will do here is inside of my weather app where there is templates folder I will create an other folder. I will call it as static and inside of my static folder, I will create a file which I will call it as uh, style.css, okay? So inside this thing, all my styling will go. So to be honest, I do not like styling much. I just hate styling and I hate CSS. So I just gave like, my html file html syntax to chat gpt and it provided me with a css file for this thing like css code so that's how powerful is chat gpt and these uh, tools that are basically running on chat gpt so i'll just paste my styling here so you can actually follow the same or you can actually uh, you can also try that thing okay like just give the index file and city weather file just give it a prompt like these are my two html files so can you please provide me with the styling for this so it will provide you with the styling so that's really cool and amazing you can try that as well okay so i'll just hit control s to save this thing so if i go back to my application and if i just try to reload this page yeah it's not working due to some reason Yeah, actually, I just needed to uh, refresh the server. So that was actually the issue. Okay, so you can see my styling has applied now. So you can see right here, it is actually showing me this thing right over here. So if I say now, for instance, London, and if I say for the second city, for instance, I say uh, Manchester. Okay, so if I just click on compare weather, so it should now look nice enough oh so you see right here so it's for london it says 17.75 degrees celsius so it's showing me beautiful cards actually to uh, show the forecast five day forecast for london and for manchester it's showing me like the temperature is 15.38 broken clouds and that's nice manchester is actually cooler than london so that's amazing so it says that friday saturday sunday monday and tuesday so that's really awesome and amazing so let's try to go ahead with one city so i'll say serbia it must be really cold in serbia okay so yeah you see no it's not that much due to i think due to summers the sky is clear moderate rain on friday clear sky on saturday sunday clear sky yeah that's amazing okay so if i just enter one city it will show me for that and if i enter both of them it will just give me for both of them so that was really amazing so that marks the end of our project here so i hope you like this project you like the approach like how we integrated uh, like api into our uh, django application and we developed the backend by using the power of prompts 
So that's it for this video and I shall catch you up in some other video. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Bye. Hello everyone and welcome back with another new section in this amazing course of mastering Python with the help of pen hands-on projects. Okay. This section is about the web scrapping in which you will scrap a website's data. We are like creating a sort of web scrapping bot which will automatically scrape the data whenever we run the script and it will actually send that scraped data to someone in the form of email, okay? So let's start our project with a story, okay? All right, suppose you work in an office, okay? And you are a data enthusiast, okay? Actually, your company demands you to send them a report of every match uh, after the match is completed, okay? So... What they demand, they demand you to send data in this form, like theme A, theme B, okay? And the details of the toss, like the uh, theme A score, theme B's score, okay? And the match result and a brief summary, okay? Because they want to use this data uh, in like writing a blog or something. So they want you to actually send data in this form, okay? So one thing you can do is you can just move on to like ESPN click info website. Okay. This is really a famous website for live scores. Okay. So if I just open up this website, so, you know, world cup is like on the peak. Yeah. I can just move on to like world cup 2023 and I can just move on to the results. Maybe I can take this match. Okay. New Zealand versus Afghanistan in which like New Zealand won by 149 runs. Okay. So after the match ended, what I need to do is I just need to provide the summary of this match to my uh, boss. Okay. I need to provide summary in this form. You can see right over here. Okay. So I do not want to do it manually, like taking the data from here every time when I'm asked. So I am like uh, trying to create a web scraping bot. Okay. So I will just perform that with the help of a web scraping bot. Okay. So I've created a new folder, which I call like web scraping bot. You can see right over here. So I'll just press CMD here to open this folder inside of a command prompt. And I will just provide code forward slash dot to open up, to open this thing up in VS code. Okay. So my folder is open. You can see right over here. Here I will just create a new file. Okay. And I'll just create a Python file. Let's, let's just save it first. I will call it as scrape.py. First I need some modules. Okay. I need requests which is like built in uh, the Python, then I will just import from BS4. Beautiful soap. Okay. Then I need to specify a URL. This would be my URL. You can see right over here. Okay. So this is my URL. I just take uh, this URL. Okay. And if you're getting error while running the script, then you need to just uh, open up the terminal here. And you need to just provide in a command like pip install requests and beautiful soup for, okay? Just hit enter. I already have installed them. So it says like requirements already satisfied. So if you do not have installed, it will install it for you. Okay. So I'll just close this thing out. I just have taken the URL and now I'll just uh, get the URL with the help of like a uh, request. Okay. I'll say response equals request dot get then I'll pass in the URL. Okay. Now with the help of beautiful soup, I'll just parse this as HTML parser so that it looks pleasing to the eyes. Okay. So I can just say response dot text. Okay. Comma HTML dot parser. Okay. So if I just try to print this soup, so it will just 
take the data for me okay let's see what i get here you see i am getting all the data of the web page in this form okay doc html and all the uh, like tags and everything like javascript as well so i don't need in this form okay i'll just cancel this out and get rid of this print statement okay so now what i need to do first thing i need is like team a okay what is the team a which we are taking the result so we can just gather both of the teams so if we just move on to my uh, web page and if i just try to inspect this page okay so inspection is like really important in this case because we are just dealing with tags okay so if you just come here here where is the team name coming from okay so if i just expand this thing yeah you can see right over here okay this is where the this thing is coming from new zealand it is inside of like a tag and this is the class okay so now what i will do i'll just declare a variable like pl teams okay like playing teams and i'll say soup okay with the help of beautiful soup soup dot find underscore all okay this is a function of beautiful soup and i'll just provide the tag name which is like a tag or i can say anchor tag okay this thing and this is my class you can see right over here this is my class i'll just copy this class and i'll just go back to my uh, code and i'll say class underscore equals the name of the class okay now i'll get everything with a tag which has this class okay now what i'll do i'll just simply first i'll check whether how many of the classes i have so i'll just hit control f and i can just see that i have like 29 classes okay so now what i can do i can just if i just click on this thing you can see i have an anchor tag and inside of an anchor tag i have like span tag okay and which has this class you can see right over here okay this class is with anchor tag so if i just click on this thing again like new zealand okay so you can see that i have this anchor tag i'll just get rid of this thing and inside of the anchor tag i have this span with this class okay you can see right over here so what i will do i can just simply go back and i can say like pl team in like pl teams okay i'm just iterating through this uh like whole thing which we got okay i can say t equals pl team dot find we are like further finding the uh, tag which is like span comma class underscore equals this class okay which we get from here this class it ends with like ds block ds truncate like you can see right over here okay now i'll just uh, say if we found any t okay i'll say print t dot text okay so let's run it to see whether we can find it or not so you see we have found like new zealand and afghanistan like both of the teams so now what we can do we can just simply define a list called teams playing and this would be empty for now and for every t which we will find we will just simply say play uh, like we'll simply say teams playing dot append okay t dot text okay so now if i just uh, try to print teams playing and if i now run this thing i'll get the list like new zealand comma afghanistan okay the two teams which are playing you can see right over here okay so now our first part is like done so second part we need like toss details like who won the toss so similarly i can just copy this line paste it here i can say like toss equals okay and we need to just check where the toss information is coming from if i just close this thing out and if i just scroll down yeah here it is like you can see right over here toss like afghanistan and elected to field first okay so if i just 
inspect it again i need to just click on this thing and select here okay so you can see that i have a td class and inside of td class i have like spent so if i just try to find this thing out i have like 35 matches okay so i can just take this span tag with this class okay i'll copy this class come back here and i can say toss equals like soup dot find all with like span and i need to give in like this class okay so now what i can do i can just iterate it once again i can say for t in toss now you need to be proactive here because whenever there are like toss details there would be a word which is called elected okay if like new zealand have won the toss they should have elected to field first or elected to bat first afghanistan won the toss they so they should also elect something okay so you should know that i am just iterating this whole list i'll say if uh, a keyword that is elected in like t dot text okay so i'll just uh, add another variable like toss winner equals t dot text okay now what i'll do i'll just uh, print toss winner and now if we just run this thing let's see whether we get the details of toss winner or not okay so you see we got new zealand afghanistan and afghanistan elected to field first okay so we are heading towards the right direction now the third part we need is like the team a score and team b score okay so from where we can get that i think from the top here okay so here the here it is like the score of team a which is inside of like this div you can see right over here okay so if i just try to find this div i think we only have got two of them okay so one div is for like the second inning score okay and the other one is like for the first inning score so yeah we are like good to use this div okay so now what i can do i can just simply say team sc or like score equals like uh, soup dot find underscore all okay then i can just provide the tag which is like div okay comma class equal like underscore equals and i can just provide that class okay now i can just simply like print the length of team score to see how many of them i am getting i think the length would be two in this case okay yeah you see right over here so now we just simply need to just gather the text of this thing okay like in the first div if you can see right over here that the text is this thing okay it will automatically take the text inside of span and for the second div it will just take in this text both of them like 34.4 overs and 139 score so let's try to implement that as well okay so i'll say i'll just get rid of this thing i'll say for t a n team s c okay print te dot text okay let's try to see what we will get in this scenario okay so you see this score is for the team a and this score is for the team b so now we can just simply create a new list like team scores equals empty list and i can just append this list with the text okay i'll say team scores dot append and te dot text now if i just try to print team scores which is like this thing right over here so now i'll get the both scores in the form of text uh, like list okay so you see right over here this is the first element and this one is the second one okay so now we are pretty much done with our third part as well we are done with team a team b 
We are done with toss as well. We are done with both scores as well. Let's try to add the player of the match as well, okay? It would be an interesting thing to add. So if I just move to this like here, you see player of the match is coming from this thing right over here. So if I just try to select this thing, okay? Or maybe I can just take it from somewhere else. Let's see where I can find the player of the match like anywhere else or not player. Yeah, I can just take it from this table as well. Let's inspect it to see. So here you can see is the name. Okay, so we have to like go inside of like TR. Okay, it doesn't have any class. And then inside of TR, we need to like find this TD. Okay with this class. Okay, first let's try to just uh, fetch the TR with no class and then uh, we will actually try to find like TD, okay? Cause obviously we'll get like multiple TR classes. So we can just like filter the class with like this player of the match, okay? This keyword. How we can do that? We'll just simply move on to the code and I'll say P or T M like player of the match equals soup dot find underscore all and it would be like uh, T R tag okay this thing right over here because it has no class so I do not want to provide the class here okay first let's just try to print like the length of this T R okay P O like P O T M to see how many of them we got here. Okay. So you see, we have got like 80 of them. So now we need to just narrow them down. Okay. So I'll say for P in P O T M. Okay. I'll say another variable T equals T dot find. Okay. We need to find T D's inside of like T R. Okay with class underscore equals like this class, okay? We need to find TDs with this class, okay? You see right over here, okay? So I'll say if T is there, okay? Because this like dot find function can return none as well, so it will give you an error. So you should provide like if T, if like there is uh, any value or any instance, okay? Then I will just search like if player of the match like this thing is present inside of like uh, t dot text okay in the text of like this td with class this thing okay and t dot text okay so what i'll do like by searching this thing, we will be sure that we'll reach this thing, like right over here. We will be like talking about this TR with like uh, this TR and this, the TD class is this one. And we have like the text which matches player of the match. So we'll get to here. Now what we'll do, we'll just simply find the span inside of this TR class, like this span, okay? And we'll, we can then just uh, fetch the title from here, title of the span. So let's see how we can do that, okay? So I'll say PM, okay, equals P dot find. I'm again finding it from here, okay? Like here, P dot find. And I'll say I need to get the span with like the class underscore equals like this class, okay? I'll copy this class, sorry, this class, this one, okay? DS cursor pointer because I need to fetch this title from here. Or you can just provide the class of this thing and you can get the text, but I'll prefer to just fetch the title. So what I'll do, I'll just uh, provide the name of the class, okay? And then, if, then I'll say, if I find this PM, so what should you do? I'll just add player underscore of underscore the match, another variable equals PM, this thing right over here and I'll just provide in with title okay now I think I should have got the player of the match so let's try to print this thing 
I'll say print player of the match and let's run to see whether I get the player of the match as well or not. Okay. So you see right over here, just get the player of the match as. So now we actually need like match result and a brief summary. Okay. To get match result and brief summary, what you can do, you can see that we have a title of the page, the whole page. We have got the title and in the title, we have actually got a brief summary. Okay. If we just try to search uh, here for the title, so I'm getting like multiple ones. So if I just try to open this thing, you see that here is the brief summary inside of the title tag. Like New Zealand beat Afghanistan, New Zealand won by 149 runs, Afghanistan versus New Zealand, ICC Cricket World Cup, 16th match, uh, stadium as well, uh, the date of the match as well, and the report as well, okay? So it would be quite simple for us. So what I can do, I can just simply say match underscore result underscore tag, okay? Equals like soup dot find. I'll just find the title, okay? Title is actually the single one which is on the top of any HTML, okay? So I can simply get one, okay? So now I can say result equals match result tag dot get text okay i'm getting text from this title tag and now if i just try to print this thing okay, uh, like result now i should actually get the result of the match as well okay so you see new zealand beat afghanistan like new zealand won by this much runs afghanistan versus new zealand icc cricket world cup 16th match that dash stadium chennai october uh, match held in Chennai, October 18, and match summary report by ESPN Crick Info. Okay, so I think I have covered everything which we need to send it as a summary. Okay, I just simply want to create a variable which would be like match underscore summary. Okay, now I'll just give it with an F string. I'll just add F and then like three double quotes. Okay. And it will end with three of them as well. Okay. Here I will add my match summary. Here I'll say match summary. I can say like uh, team. Where is the team? Yeah, teams playing. Okay. So I can say like teams playing zero. Okay. Versus actually you need to add the variables inside of F string with this like curly back braces. So I can say one. Okay. So if I just try to uh, print this match summary, you will get a better idea like what I'm doing. I'm just creating a summary. Okay. In which form I have to send it via email. You can also add it inside of a file as well. But for now, this is absolutely fine. You can see match summary like New Zealand versus Afghanistan. Okay. Now I will just simply say team A and team B. Okay. I can just simply take it from here. Team A would be like New Zealand and team B would be like Afghanistan. Okay. Now I need to add the toss details which would be like coming from here. Okay. Where is the toss? Yeah, here, toss winner. I'll simply add curly braces and toss winner. And then what I need to send, like score of the first team and score of the second team. Okay, so I'll say score, which would be like equals to, yeah, team scores. Okay, this is also a list. So I can just add a first team here, add it inside of curly braces. Now I can just copy this line for like, team B score okay so I'll just change the index one and one here okay now if we just try to run this thing so you would see summary in a better way so you see now here is the summary match summary uh, team A team B toss details like team A score and team B score okay so you see that we are just getting into this thing and now I'll just try to add like player of the match, player of the match, I'll say, yeah, player of the match and then result and brief summary. Okay. Now I'll say result. Okay. So here our match summary is completed. So now you will see that we'll get a summary in this form like 
This is our summary. New Zealand versus Afghanistan, Team A, Team B. Toss details and score is like 288 for 6. Afghanistan score is like this one. Player of the match, Glenn Phillips. Okay, result and brief summary. New Zealand beat Afghanistan. New Zealand won by like this much runs. And this is our like brief summary. And our summary is ready. Okay. So now what I need to do, I also want to send this thing as an email. Okay. So for that, what I'll do, I'll just create a new file, which would be like email underscore sender dot py. Okay. I'll use this file to send email, like send this thing as an email. So first I'll import like uh, three libraries, okay? They are like built in like with your Python module, so you do not need to install them. Now actually I am defining uh, a function, define send underscore email, okay? This would take a subject and body along with like sender underscore email comma receiver underscore email okay then it would take like S stmp server which is responsible for delivering this email and then we will just take a couple more things which is like stmp port stmp username as well and stmp underscore password as well okay so these are the parameters which are required in this function so now what i'll do first thing is that i'll just say message okay i'll define a variable equals m i m e multi part okay we're using this to actually deal with emails then message from okay we need to like uh, do it in this form like sender underscore email okay then message to equals receiver underscore email. okay then message subject which would be equals to subject okay then we need the attachment as well message dot attach i'll say m i m e text body okay body will be attached in like plain form okay now what i'll do i'll just simply try and accept block here i'll say try server equals st sorry s m t p l i b okay dot s m t p i'll provide the server s m t p underscore server comma s m t p underscore port okay so these two things are required actually to send an email so now we have to actually start our server start tls okay then we need to log in log in with like s m t p username comma s m t p password okay then what we need to do we actually need to send our mail okay we say server dot send mail with like sender email comma receiver email then message as will dot as underscore string okay then we need to quit our server and print like email sent successfully to receiver email okay like email successfully sent to that person then we need to provide an accept block accept exception as e okay print email could not be sent okay and we need to print our error as well i'll say error comma str error okay this will print our error on the con so that's pretty much it for like uh, email sender dot py file so the first thing i'll do when i'll come to our main file i'll just uh, import like i'll say import send email from email underscore sender dot py okay i'm sorry from i'm just taking this function okay i'm importing this function inside of this file so that i can use it what's happening uh -huh. it says like invalid syntax oops sorry i can just say from email underscore sender import uh, like send email okay in this way now i need to configure to use our function okay let's just get rid of this thing i'll say sender underscore email equals my email okay 
from where I am sending this thing. Then receiver email to whom you want to send this email. Okay. Now we need to provide an ST, sorry, SMTP underscore server. Okay. STMP, wait a minute. I think I have made a mistake here. Mm -hmm. Here it is like SMTP, SMTP, okay. SMTP, okay. So like this, I need to change in everything because it can like produce an error. Okay, so I can just say replace with SMTP. Yeah, now it's fixed. Okay, I can just save this file and I can come back here. Again, I can say SMTP server equals SMTP dot gmail dot okay smtp underscore port equals 587 these are the things that you should follow as it is then smtp underscore username okay username is actually your email so i'll just copy this thing paste it here okay then we need to specify the password as well okay i'll tell you how to get the password okay this password in a while because your gmail password might not work in this case okay then we need to specify the subject okay equals like match summary of today's of today match it can be anything okay then we need to just call our send email function and we need to provide like you can see we need to provide these things i will just copy everything from here because it tells me like it takes these things so i have a subject okay like uh, for body i can just provide in with like match summary where is the match summary this is our body in this case and sender email it's here receiver email is here smtp server is here port is here and username is also here and see it's a typo smtp username it's here and SMTP password is also here, okay? So we are pretty much done with our thing. Now, what I'll do, I'll just save this thing and I'll just try to send this, like run this thing to send the email to see is everything working okay or not. So you see we got an error like SMTP auth extension not supported by server, okay? I think I should check my password let me check what's the issue okay maybe oh yeah i think it's in small okay from to subject m i m e text body comma plane smtp server comma port start tls oh yeah it is actually a function okay server dot login with username and password server dot send email and server dot quit email successfully sent to receiver email email could not be error okay let's try to save this thing save this as well and let's try to run it again to see whether everything works as expected or not okay yeah okay so you see that the email is successfully sent to i need to actually add in a space here for next time so let's see whether we received an email or not okay so you see that i just received an email okay this is our new email okay so now i'll tell you how to actually get this password for your email okay for for like your gmail okay so what you need to do you just want to go to google.com and you need to type in like gmail app password okay so you see here is the like google help sign in like signing in with your app password so you need to go to your google account from here okay move to the security come all the way down okay uh, and you need to just click on two-step verification then you need to provide in your password to sign in and if you just scroll and if you just scroll all the way down so here it is like app password you just need to add a new you just need to write a new name like you say match summary okay and then just click on create so here is the app password you need to copy this thing and you can just simply paste it here okay so then save this thing now let's just try to change the uh, subject I say of today match and 
And one more thing, you know why it is important to do this like we are using web scrapping bot because whenever you will provide with some other link, okay, you see that our link ends with like live cricket score. So suppose you are like taking another match. I just go to the series and results. Let's try to take this match, okay, for instance. So let's try to come to the summary like this is our link live cricket score one so i'll just change the link here control v save this thing and i'll just try to run this thing and see whether everything works as expected or not okay so you see that we just got this thing and email also successfully sent so if i just come back here so you see match summary like netherlands versus south africa team a was netherlands team b was south africa like Toss details, South Africa elected to field first. Netherlands score 245 for 8 in 43 hours because match was re reduced by rain. And South Africa score 42.5. South Africa score like 207 all out, like in 42.5 hours in pursuing the target of 246, okay? And this is the player of the match, Scott Edwards. And brief summary, like Netherlands beat, beat South Africa. Like Netherlands won by 38 runs. So this is actually the brief summary of the match. So you see that by just changing one link, we can just get the desired data. So that's the beauty of web scrapping, okay? Because web pages, they do not change that much, okay? So if a website is running and it's like adding all the data again and again, so it is like like I, that I'm like pretty much sure that the tags and all of the HTML stuff remains the same, just the text, it gets changing, okay? I hope you got the idea of like how this thing works, uh, like web scraping in Python. We just completed an end-to-end -end project on web scraping by using the power of Python, okay? So that marks the end of our, this project. I hope you like this one. Thank you so much for watching this and I shall catch you up in some other. Till then, have a good day. Bye. Hey everyone, welcome to our exciting project, Data Analysis with Panas. So yeah, as you guys know, like in today's fast-paced world, data has become a vital asset for individuals and business alike. So yeah, the ability to extract meaningful insights from data is really crucial for informed decision-making and getting a competitive edge. So yeah, our project on Data Analysis with Panas is designed to empower you with the skills and knowledge needed to harness the potential of data. So yeah, uh, by the end of this project, we have few objectives objectives so you'll be able to learn like how to load clean and pre-process data using pandas ensuring its quality and reliability and also you'll utilize various functions and methods in pandas to conduct comprehensive data analysis you know exploring correlations trends and key insights and you'll also be able to create a meaningful visualizations to present your findings in a clear and compelling manner and yet yeah, in the end you'll be able to translate your analysis into actionable insights that will drive meaningful business decisions for you guys so if we talk about a few of the important tools they'll be using in this project, so we'll be using Pandas and IPython. So if we talk about Pandas, what is Pandas? So Pandas is basically an open source data manipulation and analysis library for Python. Uh, it provides data structures and functions that are, you know, needed to work with structured data seamlessly, making it an essential tool for data analysis projects. So yeah, uh, here are some of the key components of Pandas. So Pandas provide data frame that is basically a two-dimensional labeled data structure you know very similar to spreadsheet or SQL table so in that uh, you can easily store and manipulate data with columns of potentially different types and it provides series you know that is a one-dimensional labeled array which is capable of holding any data type it can be like integer string, float, Python objects, etc. And yeah, Pandas allows you to load data from various file formats. It can also help you to clean and pre-process data, including handling missing values, duplicates and data type conversions. It can also help you to perform data analysis to operations like, you know, filtering, grouping, aggregating, merging and reshaping. 
and it can also help you visualize data using integration with other libraries you know like matplotlib and c1 and it can also help you to save the pre-processed data back to different file formats for further use okay so now if we talk about ipython so ipython is an interactive computing environment that allows you to create and share interactive documents as well as code and visualizations so here are some key features of ipython as well so ipython provides an enhanced interactive shell for executing python code interactively and exploring data in real time and ipython notebooks provide an interactive computing environment that allows the creation and sharing of documents you know that contain live code equations visualizations and narrative text and you know also ipython enhances the display of results allowing rich outputs such as images videos html and more within the notebook interface so yeah these are basically two of the tools they'll be using in this project so stay tuned for that so yeah uh, that was it for this video so in this video we went through the introduction of this project and some of the important tools they'll be using along in uh in this project so i hope you like this video and i'll see you in the next one until then take care bye bye all right so now let's get back to work uh, from this lecture we'll be talking about manipulation you know like modifying some values or maybe about indexing and slicing and all those things so yeah uh, we'll be doing all this stuff from this lecture so the first thing that i want to talk about is remember uh this one is the column or the header and this one is a row or we call it as index as well so if i talk about first index of a visitor that is 700 and if i talk about first and second index of visitor that is 700 and 900 um if i talk about a first column then of first row this that it means 700 and if i talk about first column and first and second row so that means 700 and 900 so these are actually you know labels of our column okay so uh, whenever we try to slice something or whenever we try to index something uh, we use label based indexing so you know that means i would be using their names particular names you know and I can say like uh, data of visitor, uh, bounce rate and country, or, you know, I can use positions like uh, zero, one, uh, two, three, or something like that I need to follow. So there are basically two approaches for slicing and indexing. So the first one is label based and the second one is position based. So let us get started. So let us take our first task. What I have to do is I have to take a slice or I have to take an index from second to fifth and I need only country and clicks. So for that, I would be using my data frame and then I need to use log that is LOC. And then with a the square bracket, I need to pass two parameters. So I need to pass like the label names. Uh, that is like if I'm taking index, I need to pass your label names. And let's just say if I'm taking columns, I need to pass your label names. So suppose I need a uh, intersection from two to fifth and country to clicks. Okay, so I would be passing the first value as two and fifth and then colon and you need to basically intersection from country to clicks. Okay, so let me take an example and let me try to execute this one. You see, I got my results. So here I am taking labels. Uh, remember, whenever you are going to use log that is L-O-C-K, uh, you are going to intersection with labels so you know here uh, the difference will be if i'm taking the index value as you remember with a uh, list this fifth will not be included okay um so yeah in this case uh we are basically depending on labels so it is working as a label and not the index value as like zero one two three it is actually a label and is considered as label names same follows with this particular header so one point I need to talk about what if I need a country clicks and dates so all you have to do is take from countries to days so if I would take country clicks and days uh, let me first execute this one so here you will get the result from uh, country clicks and days so it's basically intersection and what we are doing is we are taking this particular part uh, you have to be clear careful with slicing and one thing you need to remember is that this is not saved in day of one memory so if i use my df1 and print that you would see like it's uh still having this result right so that means like this log is not an in place operation so uh you have to create a new variable and store them let me create like a df2 store these values inside that variable and let me open a new shell and then print out my df2 here um you can see I got my results successfully. I hope this was clear to you guys. Now let me execute few more results and delete this shell. So 
what if I need a value from a single cell? Maybe I want clicks, I just want this particular third label. So all I have to do is just pass the value. So maybe I just want three, uh, these, this three and just one clicks, okay? So yeah, uh, you can see I got the value of 12, that is clicks, and then from the third as well. So this looks fine. I'm able to get the value of every single cell. Now, uh, now what if I need all the rows for clicks? That means I need all the rows only for click for rows. So we can get all the elements and uh, then, you know, comma and then just add clicks. So this way we will return you the results of click, okay? Now, this was uh, basically important for log in which we totally depend on labels and I really agree with that because, you know, you might be using different name instead of zero. You might be using like some particular index like we did in the earlier videos. So we used to set uh, index and then we can use that as well. All right. All right, so the second one I want to talk about is ilog. We totally depend on the index values. That is basically the numbering. So now here I need to, you know, pass two values again. But remember this time, this will be numbers, okay? So suppose I need to slice values from six to eight and I want from visitor to days, okay? So six to eight means I, you know, need to take six at my starting point and I want to include the eight. So, you know, I would be taking nine. That means six to nine where nine will... Uh, not be included in that. So remember the list system also we are using our log if uh, we are using log that is LOC I would be using you know 6 to 8 because it depends on labels. So whereas I would love to depend on the index position. So the second thing uh, is I'm taking visitors today. So visitors means its value is 1 and the day value is 5. And uh, if I execute this one uh, you can see I'm able to grab uh, like a specific result like so yeah here I cannot pass visitor as a label and I cannot pass day as a label as well and let's just say if I try to attempt that I would definitely get an error let me try uh, that one here you can see I got an error and if I scroll down uh, you can see uh, I cannot do slice indexing on uh, you know with these indexers so this so this is a type error and I cannot utilize that in that so you can also do a lot more stuff with iLock. So if you want a particular row, maybe I just want, you know, let's just say row five, number five, I can simply enter that and I can execute this one. Uh, so you can see I got all the values of row number five. That is my visitor. So my bounce rate, my country and my click. Okay. And if I want just one value, I just need to pass as to say that particular position. Maybe, you know, I want from visitor to BR only. So remember, uh, this last value will not be included. So visitor to BR means like one and two, okay? Where like uh, three would not be included. And let me do that one again from my visitor to a day and that looks fine. So next thing I want to talk about is IX. Uh, we have talked about log, then I log and then IX, okay? So IX basically take both, uh, it take indexes as well as labels. So which is quite convenient. So yeah, there you have it. Uh, the motive of this lecture was to make you understand like how to do slicing thing, how to slice a particular portion and how to take particular values. So yeah, I hope you like this video and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, guys, welcome back. So now in this lecture, let's we'll talk about CSV file, JSON file, XLS file and TXT file and also uh, what is comma separated file or maybe semicolon separated file as well. So yeah, there are different type of files that we need to uh, blame. And remember, I'm just taking 10 days of data. Uh, usually if someone tried to audit, they may take like a 365 days data as well. So yeah, first of all, let me create data frame three panels and then read JSON method and then the file name. Same follows with my JSON file. But uh, here you can see I am getting a different result from what I was expecting. Uh, from my CSV and Excel file, um, here you can see the sequence of column is not there since we have a defined and label column. Uh, there's not a big issue. Uh, why this happening? Because, uh, you know, the JSON is just like a dictionary. And if you remember, dictionary don't have sequence or indexes, right? So they are known with this key. So this is their key and this is their value. Let me open a JSON file. So this is how a JSON file is going to uh, look like. So how do they know that this was my header and these are all the fields?
So we have a parameter here which is called header and which is my default true. That means uh, they will consider first line as header and if I try to make header as none. So they would definitely include that in the value pair. So uh, let me execute this one. You can see our result now. So what actually happened is I just did header as none. Now they are considering them as the other value. So now uh, we have 10 different values, which was uh, basically different. But uh, if I try to remove this header right here, which is by default as true, and I need to execute both the files, okay? So yeah, you can see we are back with the result and you can play with uh, Jupyter upside down. So whenever you want to edit any line, you just need to jump on that line. So I hope now you understand about the header field. Also Excel CVC file follows the same rule, but JSON file we have key, okay? And value pair, so they can directly differentiate. So let me delete this cell and let me work more with my Excel file. So all you have to do is DD. So now I have a thought. So now I have a thought, what if I try to remove this index and you know, try to use date as index since you know, I. No, this is not uh, useful for me. So this zero, one, two, all in it is date and then the results. So we can do that. Uh, we can change this date into our index that is basically uh, into our row field. So to perform that, we just need to do a simple task, create it at a frame, then use a method as set index and then pass the value. Here, my value will be date since I want to date to be treated as index. So now, if I check out the output here, you can see it's changed. And now you can compare both the results. Uh, now we have date as our index, okay? So, and we are only uh, dealing with five major columns since sixth is our uh, date, but it's treated as index. We don't have this uh, zero, one, two, three, and we have our index as one, two, three. Uh, you can also pass different type of values. So if I try to make day as index, it worked fine. Now my date is included in our column and this day is working as index. Okay. So yeah, you can treat uh, them accordingly. Now the next thing I want to talk about is you can also check their shape as well. So if you remember while doing math, we used to matrix shape. Okay. So uh, we can also do shape of a table. So let me do that. You can see it's currently 10 by 6. That means 10 rows and 6 columns. But if I try to print my DF2, let's just say, This is printing the default table because we are not saving this. We're just, uh, you know, printing that. So if I want to save this result, all I have to do is either save it in a new variable. That is my new data frame, or I can just override my previous variable as well. Now, if I try to print DF2, you can see this is a permanent change. Earlier, I was not uh, doing that permanent change. I was just trying to change these things, test them out, print them, but I was just storing them in any variable. I hope till now things are looking fine. This uh, might be confusing, but you know, with practice, uh, you can now, e you can like easily Excel them. So yeah, let me create a new cell and then play with my uh, TXT files. Remember, uh, whenever we are going to read my TXT file, we need to use CSV, okay? And CSV is comma separated. Before reading both the text file, look at them here. I am taking comma separated file, you can see all the values are separated with the help of comma and the second txt file that i'm taking is separated with the help of semicolon right so yeah there is a parameter called separate and by default it is comma so if i try to run this file this would run perfectly so let me use my traffic commas So you can see I was able to get my result for my data frame four because here we have a parameter called sep and have a value by default is comma. So they have just separated um, all the commas and give us the result. But if I try to run this semicolon file, we would get an error. Let me do that real quickly for you guys. All right. All right, so yeah, now uh, you can see what I'm getting. I'm getting an index and then one row. Uh, this is the complete row and all the results in a complete row as well. So there are basically 10 different rows and one column. So they are recognizing this as a complete column. So I need to add a parameter concept and then pass on my semicolon. Now, if I try to execute this one, you can see I was able to get the results. So yeah, that's how we play with different parameters. The next thing is uh, to read our file directly from online source. In the next lecture, let us directly use our online links and perform the same. So yeah, I'll see you in the next lecture, okay?
Okay, now let us uh, talk about Jupyter Notebook. So I would talk about uh, editor as well as interactive shells. So the Jupyter Notebook is actually a hybrid tool in which we can do like both the things simultaneously, okay? Uh, that means we can check our code. Also, we can save that code inside a file. So remember, we have to install that locally and then we can use that on our local host. Uh, so yeah, this is a really simple tool which works on browser and it's really handy to deal data on browser instead of our command line shell. So yeah, uh, let us install our Jupyter Notebook. So installing Jupyter Notebook with the help of pip install and then Jupyter, okay? Okay, so once that is installed, make sure you go inside your desired folder. I'll be working inside PyPandas because we can uh, save files of Jupyter Notebooks. So I would be recommending you guys to create a new folder and work inside that, okay? So I uh, would be working inside my PyPandas and to open my Jupyter Notebook, all you have to do is call a command Jupyter and then Notebook. Here you can see it would be working on your default browser and currently my local host is working on my default browser that is actually my Internet Explorer or Edge. So yeah, here you can see all my activities and uh, you can also see in my CMD that is my command prompt. So the reason for a specific folder is that uh, you can also see the different files that are available inside my folder. And if I want to create a new file that is my Jupyter Notebook file, all I have to do is click on new and my Python version, uh, just click on that and here you will get your interactive shell that you can save. So this is our interactive shell and inside this interactive shell if I want to print something, let's just say, maybe print one, two, three here, single enter means new line in that shell and control plus enter means to execute that particular shell. So this was my shell first, uh, these were the three lines and when I use single enter, I was creating a new line inside that shell. Okay, and uh, when I press uh, control plus enter, then I executed that line. So now to create a new shell, you have to use um, alt plus enter, and I can execute more codes inside this particular line. Maybe, you know, print four or maybe import my pan as here. But remember to create a new line, it's enter, okay? And to execute that is control plus enter, right? Or you can uh, just directly create a new shell. It would be executed. Uh, here you can see how it's working. So this is the basic example of Jupyter shell. We'll be working uh, with that in the next lecture. So let me just save this file. But before saving, let me open my PyPandas folder. Here you can see I have a file called ipynb. That is my ipython notebook. And it is currently entitled. So let me just save this one with the title. <coughs> Okay, here you go. I got my script one's name and it's automatically saved. And whenever I want to edit this script, I can do that with my interactive shell as well as my editor. So yeah, in the next lecture, uh, let us use our Python, use different type of files and try to play with their data. So yeah, see you in the next one. All right, so now let us talk about some of the important uh, commands that we can perform in our Jupyter Notebook. So yeah, if you are someone who is going into data analysis field for your future, uh, Jupyter Notebook is one of the best choice for you guys. So also these are a few really important things that you need to remember as well. So yeah, I hope you will give it a look. Uh, and now let us do some basic things. So first of all, let me import my PANAS and also let me try to take CSV and read the file. So all I have to do is just import PANAS. Once PANAS is imported, uh, you have to create a data frame. Now here, remember, I'm trying to read a CSV. So I would be using a method that is called read underscore CSV. In the previous videos, uh, we were directly using a dictionary or a list as you guys remember. So in this lecture, we are trying to read a CSV file that is stored in the same folder, which is basically our PyPandas folder, right? So yeah, uh, I've taken care of that. So I'm be reading any particular file. I have to take care about that as well. So read CSV is the matter for uh, you no know, text file or CSV file. So now here I need to give my location of my file. Since they are both in the same folder, I have to give its file name. Otherwise, I have to define C drive or D drive or the required folder, like whatever it takes. So, so yeah, here they are both in the same folder. I just need to pass my file name, press Alt plus Enter to execute this line. It 
here and uh, now you can see I'm able to get my results. So I'm just basically reading CSV file at this point of time. So we'll be reading all the different type of formats in the next lecture, okay? Uh, but yeah, at this point of time, um, we have to see this is a tabular form and let me open my CSV file now. So uh, this is the main file we are reading uh, it in our Jupyter notebook. Um, I hope now you are able to understand that. So let me open my Excel file and let me create a new shell that is Alt plus Enter and then create my data frame too. So yeah, then I'll be using my pandas and then read Excel and then I'll need to pass my file name. Okay, uh, let me execute uh, this one with the help of control and enter first of all. And yeah, now you can see I got an error. So now you need to think like why we are going to get this error. Let me read this one. So here we have error called module name XLRD not found. So basically recently Pandas got updated and uh, we need to install this particular dependency to run our Excel file. Um, also not a big issue on this one. All you have to do is use pip install and then give the dependency ta name, sorry, and let me do that. Okay, so now let me install uh, this dependency and run my Excel file. You can also check the background and you can see we have a connection error at this point of time because we have disturbed our Jupyter Notebook. Okay, um, it's done. Let me run my Jupyter Notebook again. And this works fine. Let me close the old tabs and open my script one. Now let me execute this one. All you have to do is control plus enter. Remember, you might get an error because of the pandas. So all you have to do is either you need to execute import pandas again. And if you are getting an error, okay, uh, let me execute this one. Yeah, and this one works fine for me. Now I'm also able to read my Excel file. So yeah, that's all for this lecture. In the last lecture, uh, let us play with all different types of formats. And you'll also learn more things regarding JSON or reading from Drag API. Okay, so yeah, I'll see you on that one. Until then, take care. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to this amazing course, Master Python to the creation of 10 unique projects. And yeah, in this section, uh, we'll talk about this amazing project, which is Conversational AI Chatbot. And in today's video, uh, we'll be talking about the comprehensive introduction to our Conversational AI Chatbot project. So yeah, as you guys know, like in today's uh, digital age, communication with technology has evolved and has become more interactive, intuitive and dynamic. So yeah, it's really important to have a good communication source uh, uh, with our technology with AI so that's why we have introduced you guys this conversational AI chatbot so first of all it's really important to understand like what is a chatbot a chatbot uh, short for chat robo as well is a computer program that is designed to simulate human conversations okay uh, so it basically uh, utilizes cutting edge technologies like natural language processing to interact with users and also understand their inputs and because of that generate meaningful responses. So yeah, uh, at its core, a chatbot is an interface that allows users to interact with the computer system using natural language. It can be integrated into various platforms that like, you know, as you guys have heard, like a lot of them, which are messaging apps, websites or customer service platforms as well. So yeah, uh, if we discuss like how chatbots were. So chatbots uh, work through a series of steps. So the first step analyze the input from the user, identifying the intent or purpose behind the message. Then after that, they extract relevant information and use it to generate appropriate and contextually accurate responses. And yeah, uh, chatbots learn and improve their responses over time based on data and user interactions. So yeah, uh, in this video as well, we'll also uh, see a project demo, like uh, what exactly are we going to be doing in this whole project? So let's just go to that. All right, so now we'll uh, take a look about the quick demo of our conversational chatbot. So we are going to utilize OpenAI with the help of API and we're going to have a conversation with AI. So uh, what we're going to do is we are uh, going to have a proper assistance, AI assistance for a niche field. Uh, that means we can have a software developer assistance or, you know, a maybe cooking um, expert or maybe like sport expert, weather expert, architectural expert or uh, some anything else you can say so uh, we can have expert for any specific field uh, throughout the process You'll basically understand like why we are talking a niche field or why we are not using a general assistance uh, And why we are going to have a specific expert or specific assistance and the other thing is uh, we are going to have Conversations, so that means I'm going to send a question. They are going to reply me then I'm going to have another question 
and they will have access to all my previous information. Like, how is that? So that means uh, if I have a conversation with AI, uh, they give me uh, the information about Python programming. Let's just say AI will explain me about Python programming. Now, if I ask about salary, AI already knows like, you know, that I'm talking about Python programming or Python developer salary because, you know, I'm going to have a conversation and we have information about all the previous history. Like that's how it works. Okay. So the other thing is we are going to hide our API key. So we will also understand like about how to use a .env. It's a different package uh, that helps us to hide certain information on our code. Uh, we'll also understand that we are going to have a conversation. So it's important for us to have a loop. We are also going to save our conversation according to timestamps. So let's just say if I have a conversation with my chatbot right now, if I run this one, let's uh, say information about, uh, let's say back and development. That seems sounds good. So now, uh, if I ask a new question, maybe salary or convers our conversational bot will already have information that I'm talking about, you know, salary related to back-end development. So if I say average salary, uh, my chatbot already know that, um, you know, I'm talking about salary for a back-end developer. So let me try to quit. That's done. And uh, now I can also jump here with my chat history because, you know, it's already saved according to timestamp. So I hope you got the idea so we can play now with multiple type of assistants. We can do a lot of stuff. Actually, this was basically just a quick demo that we're going to do. Also, our API key is stored in a different file, which is environmental variable file which is ENV to be precise. You'll understand through other projects. So that is it for this video. And I'll see you on the next one. Hey there, uh, welcome back. So previously we worked on a chat GPT project uh, in which we utilize simple API, you know, send some information and get some response. So that means we were trying to send a single information, uh, maybe like writing a blog summary or maybe some podcast script, but you know, everything wasn't a single go. So yeah, that means we send a prompt, a query, a, we get a response, that's it, right? Things were fine till that. But what if you want to have some conversation, you know, for example, like if I uh, jump onto the playground right now and I'm going to take care here. And for example, here we are creating an AI assistance. We can create an AI assistance specifically for, you know, maybe cooking or for maybe like sports, for software development, for Python development, anything like that. So and here now we are going to have a conversation with AI. You will see like two important things here. Uh, the first thing is the AI and then a human. Uh, for example, here I ask a question. Information on Python. Now, if I submit this one, you'll get a response from AI. That's, you know, it's an interpreted high level gendered uh, programming language or something else. And yeah. And yeah, we've got it. Let's just say, uh, ask another thing. Should I learn Python in 2024? And uh, I just need to click on submit and you can see I got a response here. Now, after every response, uh, it is going to print me human. So, you know, I know that the response is complete and I can ask them my next question. So uh, let's just say I now asked about salary. So a simple, uh, so I simply need to say average salary. Uh, now remember here, I have mentioned above salary of Python developer or anything else, because you know, Chad is going to have a uh, previous information. Like every time you send a new question um, at the time of chat or conversation, we have basically context of this previous information. So if I talk about average salary right now in my prompt, in my query, you can say I'm giving this particular information. Why? Uh, because now the chat GPT whole information, okay, uh, the person is talking about Python programming. So that means they are going to ask question about salary related to Python programming. So uh, if I submit now, you can see now they are giving me answers. Um, you can say that like related to uh, Python developer only. So that's how things are going to work from now on, okay? If I suppose initially I mentioned here with my conversation that uh, you are AI assistant specifically for sport, um, it is going to behave like that, specifically for Python in this case, it is going to behave like, uh, you know, that at all. And suppose if I give an AI assistant, like maybe for someone who is traveling or maybe someone who is, you know, zookeeping or uh, someone who is expert in some animal thing, then Python term will be referred uh, towards the animal part. So if I give here uh, that you are developer AI assistant, software developer assistant in particular, then the Python term will be related to the Python programming. 
I hope you get the basic idea. So uh, this looks good. I hope you got the idea what we are trying to do over here. So let me get back here. I'm going to pull up my previous program. So the first thing I did is I created a folder which is known as chatbot and inside this I'm going to do everything. So this folder is inside my projects which is inside my desktop and I have copy uh, pasted the previous main previous main pie. So if I have this main uh, pie here uh, it's the previous example that we were working with. I hope you remember the previous example. So uh, make you understand the, what we are going to do is we are going to continue from the previous one. So I hope you got the idea. Uh, the aim of this lecture was to make you understand that now we are going to have conversation. So that means we are going to store this previous history and pass this to our prompt. Earlier we were doing like everything in one go, but now uh, since it's a conversation, we need previous contacts for that as well. All right. Hey there, welcome back. So now uh, let's try to save our chat history into txt file. And you know, it should work fine after uh, this completion of a whole while loop over here. So we have this chat is three right since I uh, created outside the while loop. So that means we can access it outside the while loop. Okay. So we can access this chat is three inside this particular function as well. So this main because uh, that's the scope. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to use my wit and I need to open a file. So this is it as well as chat history. So I'm going to say like chat history dot txt. Uh, but remember, uh, to pass them inside the code that's run, we need to mention the mode uh, which is going to be writing and uh, then we can mention the encoding part. So if you're not uh, getting any error, things are fine, but um, I need to mention uh, the default one, which is UTF-8 and uh, that should work absolutely fine. So the other thing is I'm going to call this as well in simple and I can just write my chat history, which is this chat history right here. Okay. Save. Uh, so that means after completion of my entire conversation, I'm going to write this in a file, which is chat history txt currently. Uh, currently, I don't have this, but since it's a uh, write mode, I will automatically create it. That looks good to me. Let me save uh, for now. Let me just open this sidebar. Also open my terminal now. So let me clear this up. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to run a proper chart. Um, welcome to the chat boat. So whatever I'm going to do now, I will be stored in my chat history and will be written in a file after I complete this whole conversation. This means, you know, after exiting the while loop. So let's, so let's have a chat, uh, information about Python programming, uh, looks good to me presenter. That's great. So, uh, the next thing I can ask about, uh, every salary. Great. Uh, should I learn in 2024? So now that's important. Why? Uh, now the previous context is important because, hey, uh, you can see now it knows that I'm talking about Python in 2024. Okay. And the answer is yes. Okay. So if I do quit, it is going to quit the entire thing. You can see I have a chat history txt. If I open this file, you can see I have a proper conversation user AI user. Uh, user and AI. So that's it. Uh, that's how uh, we that's how we can create we can have a proper chatbot that is working with open AI. This looks good to me. So yeah, in the next video, uh, let's talk more about it. And I'll see you in that one. Okay. Hey there, uh, welcome back. So now let's talk about you know how to hide certain information on our project. Um, it can be like secret key or it can be like any type of API key or any type of information you want. So it can be like some text as well. So uh, usually we create our environment variable file that is env file. And uh, with the help of that, we can hide any type of key. Okay, so we need to utilize one important package, which is known as Python env. So if we jump here on uh, the pip, you can search about python.env and you know, just install it. And I've already done that. So uh, if I jump onto my terminal, let me clear this up and let me install it. Um, already satisfied. So uh, make sure uh, you install this package and then we get some uh, superpower to hide certain information. Uh, what we can do is we can create a env file here in the same directory. Um, I can say uh, env, remember, you know, env and inside this, I can uh, define variables. I can just define something like, you know, API underscore key equals to remember, there will be like no space in that. Okay. And 
the text that you want to store um in our case this will be like the direct key uh, no quotation mark nothing uh, you just need to basically but uh, you just need that particular text basically so let me get it here so this will uh, this is a variable and this is the information that is going to store let me stay uh, let me save this uh, yeah now let me get back to my main remember uh, this should be in the same directory okay so now uh, what I can do is I can access this uh, how well the first thing is I need to load that information so I just need to go with my form.env I need to import a method I need to import a method which which is known as load.env and uh, I just need to run it I uh, just need to run load.env and and that's going to be it. Uh, it is going to load the environment variable file and that is the env file. Now I can access it. How? I can use my OS that is, you know, the OS module. So I can also need to import that. Let's say import OS and uh, then I can go with my environment variable here and uh, I just need to mention which variable I need to access. And this will be in the code. So I need to access this particular variable all right awesome so this is going to return this after that okay so simple step first uh install env package second thing uh create a env file third thing uh create your variable that you want to use and the next thing import the load env uh then call it as well as the os okay then you can access the environment variable um, that you just need to uh, mention the variable name and this is going to return this at the end okay um, awesome now if I save this one and if I try to have a conversation here again it should like it should like work fine okay so let's say uh, information about uh, developers salaries okay let's do for that So you can see I'm still able to access the data because the API is working. Uh, so that's going to be all. Let me quit it. Awesome. Now, uh, you might be having a question like that. Why I discussed uh, the quit function at the first priority? Like, why is it that? You know, uh, the, re the answer is because I don't want anyone to get into the loop of the open AI and spread their, you know, credits or uh, you can say tokens. So... Uh, there might be chances that you uh, might write something wrong, uh, you know, while loop and it keeps on calling every time for in the next few seconds. So maybe a hundred times in a few seconds. So there are limits by OpenAI, but I should also add a limit on how to control this while loop. All right. So yeah, I hope you got the idea. So in the next video, we'll talk more about uh, the playground and I'll see you on the next one. Until then, take care. Bye bye. Hey there. Uh, welcome back. So now let's talk about specific role to our AI. Uh, that means if you observe the playground right here. So at this point of time, we are playing with a normal general AI assistance, but uh, we can have a specific playground as well. You know, that means uh, we can initially mention that you are an AI expert for a particular field. Like, you know, it can be sports, um, maybe it can be something related to creative, something related to uh, development or anything like that. And I've been discussing this for a while, but now how to do all that? Well, suppose uh, initially you mentioned AI that, okay, so you're going to be expert for this particular field. AI will behave like that. So let's take an example here when I'm going to have any type of conversation. I pass an empty chat history. But what if uh, with this chat history, I mentioned that uh, you are working on this particular field. I can mention this, right? So I can mention a prompt that you are a helpful software developer assistant. Uh, by default, AI will assume it. Let's say I can pass a default prompt that you are a helpful software developer assistant. Let's just go for that. Wait. So uh, now if I save this one, if I try to have a conversation now, um, open my terminal, run the file, and if I ask, who are you? Okay, let's be stranger now. So what is going to happen is prompt earlier, the prompt was empty for chat history, right? When we run for the first time, right? Listen to me now. So, but now when we run for the first time, this is the information that we are sending along with who are you, and then we are expecting a response. So uh, the response is, I'm a software developer assistant. Uh, now I can ask anything and it will behave like that. So if I say how is the field and it will assume like how's the software development field automatically, right? So I hope you got the idea. So now it is going to behave like it. If I ask for the best salary, uh, best salary, in, you know, in this industry. So the industry will uh, just behave like software developer industry, best salary offered for 
Um, now, if you can see right here, it will assume best salary offered for in the software industry, it will give accordingly. So you can see a uh, best salary offered for software developer on variety of factors and they give me the examples. So I hope you got the idea how we can make an AI a particular field expert. Okay, so, so that was it for uh, this video. So in this project, we discussed like how you can basically have a conversation with your AI chatbot, how you can, you know, uh, use prompts, functions in conversation, how you can save conversation log text document, how you can secure your API key using ENV, and how you can also give a specific role to your AI. So this was our project on our conversational AI chatbot. So yeah, I hope you liked it, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, bye-bye. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another project of this amazing course, Master Python to the creation of 10 unique projects. So in this video, the topic of our project is we'll be building a video summarizer with chat GPT. Okay, so you heard me right. We'll be creating a whole project, entire line of code with the help of prompts in chat GPT. So our today's project is basically a video summarizer. So what it basically does, let's just say uh, you find a video and you don't want to watch a complete video, you just need to get the basic idea you know what that video says so our project right here will basically provide you the summary or you can say the entire main idea of what our video says what is the motive of this video so yeah uh this is basically the main purpose of our projects so this project will basically go through some of the important steps so let's just discuss those steps first of all all right so here is the code for our project so we have few steps in that so first of all we need to import libraries and the next step is basically you need to set up your open API key over here, which you can easily do uh, through openai.com. Then you will transcribe the video. So this function right here will basically transcribe the whole video for you. And the next step is we'll basically summarize the video. We'll be generating summary and then we'll have the main function, you know, and which will basically provide your video location, like, you know, whatever video you want to transcribe or make a summary of. And then uh, the last step will be the execution. All right. So yeah, uh, now let's just go ahead and try to understand like, you know, what this whole project actually does. All right, so the first step of this project is importing required libraries, you know? So first of all, we have imported OpenAI and then we have imported moviepy.editor as MP, then we have imported speech recognition as SR and import OS. Uh, so OpenAI is really important because obviously this whole project will work on the module OpenAI and the next step is import moviepy.editor. So this library right over here will basically you know uh take video as input so this is really important then we have speech recognition because obviously our video uh first of all will be converted into audio so that's why we have taken speech recognition and import os as well of course uh then we need to set up our open api key so this key right here is really important for your project because obviously you know uh in these type of projects the apis are really important because you know we are working on code and we need to import and export data throughout the course so api in this case is really really important we we also discussed you know these type of uh, projects previously as well uh, we need to set up our open ai api key so this uh, you can easily go to openai.com right here and you know in the api reference you can easily find your api key it's really really simple and then uh, after that our next step is to transcribe the video so yeah, this will be basically the main function which will transcribe the audio from the video file okay so the first step as i told you guys will be you know we'll be converting our video to audio so this full function right over here will basically transcribe that particular video to audio format okay so it uses basically movie pi you know which helps us to extract audio from the video and then that will be utilizes google speech recognition which is speech recognition which we imported right over here that will basically help to transcribe the audio from the video all right and yeah if you dive deep into this function you can see we have uh, applied while loop over here and with variable as well so while loop over here, it basically that initiates a loop that will process the audio in the chunks of 30 seconds, right? You know, until uh, the entire audio is processed. So the variable that you can see over here, like which is audio length right over here. So it basically, you know, uh, takes 30 seconds of audio data from the source using r.record, which you can see right over here. And that is basically we have taken parameter source and duration that is equal to 30. So it will basically process 30 seconds at a time. Okay, so whenever we'll execute this project, it will take a little bit of time, you know, to transcribe that uh, video to audio and then to text and then to summary, okay? So it will take 30 seconds at a time. And then if we dive uh, a bit deeper over here, you can see we have taken a variable process duration as well. So let's just say if the speech recognition engine is unable to understand the audio, you know, for the given 30 seconds of chunks. So it basically will take 30 second chunks uh, at a time 
So let's just say uh, one chunk is unable to recognize the audio, right? Or understand the audio. So it will print an error message and it will increment the process duration by 30 seconds, okay? So it will basically give an error and it will move forward to our next 30 seconds. That's what we have taken plus equal to 30, all right? And so this line of code will be used for that purpose. And then uh, we have taken accept variable. So SR dot unknown value error. It will print could not understand the audio. Let's just say our audio isn't understandable. So it will do that. So, uh, and then we have taken accept SR dot request error as E. So it will say if recognition request failed, it will say add request else it will print the request error. Okay. So this is basically uh, if an else statement we have used over here that will be for the error. Let's just say if our audio file is really, really bad and it's having a hard time to understand all that. So for that, we have taken the possible errors as well, okay? And then let's just say if all that doesn't happen, so at the end, it will print transcription has been created and it will return the transcript. So till here, uh, let's just say our audio has been extracted and it has been moved to our text portion and it's all done like our video has been converted to audio and it has been converted to text. So what will be your next step? So our next step will be summarize the transcription, okay? So we need to summarize the transcription. So that is the function of that. So we'll need to generate the summary. So our text has been written for all of our video and a script has been created. So then it will summarize the script and it will tell us like, you know, what that script exactly to so for that we have taken text and model so this model right here this is really important uh, this basically does the function of summarizing the text into you know a little one to three line text that is really easy to understand and through that you know we can get we can easily get the idea so we'll take prompt so we have taken prompt as an input and response and then it will create the summary all right and after that it will print summary has been completed and it will return the summary so after that this is basically our main function right here over here you basically provide your uh, videos or transcriptions or transcribe video will be video path. So wherever your video is in the system, so you need to provide the path for that video and then it will basically work on that. And after that, we have taken summary function. So it will generate summary for your transcription. All right. So yeah, uh, then if you take this is basically a video data injuring dot MP4. So if I can give you a little bit overview of the video. So this is the video right here. So this is basically a video regarding data engineering. It tells like what exactly is data engineering, uh, what skills do you need for that and everything, you know, you need to know about data engineering and stuff. So this video I provided to my uh, code right here or project right here. And after taking the video path, it will basically give it the output file, which will be summary.txt. So it will come right over here into our folder. So which I just told you guys about summary.txt will appear to our project folder right over here and then we have the main function at the end okay so this was basically a brief explanation of what exactly our project is going to be look like so now let's just go ahead and quickly try to run this code and see what happens okay so if i go ahead and press f5 so it's going to open the terminal for us so it's working currently obviously uh it will take a bit of time because you know uh as i told you guys earlier it will take 30 second chunks at a time. So as you guys can see, it's taking chunk now. So it's saying writing audio in temp audio. So our, you know, audio has been created. So now what it will do, it will basically uh, convert that audio to a TXT file. And after that, it will summarize this TXT file for us. Okay. So it will take a bit of time. This is a uh, minute or so. So let's just wait for that. All right. Yes. Yeah, so as you guys can see, uh, it's showing in the terminal right over here. Like, you know, the transcription has been created and the summary has been completed for our project right over here. And as you guys can see right over here as well, we do have one more file, which is summary.txt. And then we have the temp audio file as well of our whole video, which was, you know, four minute and 52 seconds, as you can see right over here. So first of all, it created that audio file for us and after that it created a summary for us okay so if you can go ahead and read our summary so you're saying data engineering is the practice of designing building and managing system for collecting storing and analyzing data it is a broad field with applications in many industries data engineers are responsible for ensuring data is accessible reliable and secure before it is used by data scientists and you know like as you guys can see it's like two to three line summary and so it's really really effective at the end, he's saying data engineering is a well-paying career with an average salary of 115000 in the U.S. So yeah, this is a very impactful summary if you ask me. And we also have a temp audio file like wave file as well. So yeah, uh, this was uh, the process. So first of all, it converted our video file into an audio file. And after that, it transcribed that file into a TXT file. And at the end, we got our summary. So yeah, that's exactly how this project is going to work. 
So we created this whole project with the help of chat GPT through, you know, these prompts. So if you can go ahead and put these prompts in chat GPT and you ask it to create me a project about video summarization. So it will help you to create the entire project for you, right? So yeah, I hope you like this uh, project. This was a really interesting project. If you ask me, so yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. In a world where creativity knows no bounds, OpenAI presents a groundbreaking innovation, Dolly. Welcome to a new era of imagination and artistry. Dolly is an OpenAI state-of-the-art image generation model. Dolly? stands for diverse and low resource image generation has the power to transform the way we perceive and interact with visual content as you might be aware of the fact that just recently microsoft bing joined hands with dolly and created an image generation model that just creates image from text inside of microsoft bing that's really amazing with Dolly, you can now unlock the limitless possibilities of creativity at your fingertips. Using Dolly is like having a virtual artist. As your ally, it understands your vision and brings it to life in ways you never thought it would have been possible. At the heart of Dolly lies advanced deep learning algorithms, allowing it to generate highly realistic and novel images from textual prompts. Its training dataset comprises a wide range of images, ensuring it can generate outputs that span multiple domains from everyday objects to fantastical concepts. Dolly's user-friendly interface empowers users to effortlessly explore their creativity. Simply input a textual prompt and witness Dolly's artistic powers. With Dolly, I can describe a scene or concept in words and it brings it to life with stunning visual representations. It's like collaborating with an AI co-creator, okay? It is inspiring minds, redefining creativity. You can unleash your power of imagination with Dolly today, okay? I beg your pardon, it's not actually the promotional video. So in this video, I will gonna show you actually how you can create an API that will be created from Dolly. We can use that API to generate images, really cool one with just providing it prompts, okay? So that's the purpose of this video actually. So without further ado, let's get ahead and just get started, okay? Thank you. The image generation concept shook the world like a bang as OpenAI created a model, image generation model called Dolly. So the idea is basically that someone can enter a prompt and it can generate really cool images, okay? So if I come here and if I log in here, for instance, and if you go to Dolly, you can see how cool images these are. You can see, and they have their prompts here as well. You can write a prompt here. I have no credits here, so it will not generate an image for me now. So I can just give it any prompt and when I click on generate, it will generate a very cool image for me. Okay. So now we are going to create our own API in which a user can actually provide a prompt. So you can see this is how the sample request look like. So I'm inside of my Python. So here you can see it's saying a cute baby sea otter. So and represents how many images you want and the size equals 1024 cross 1024. This is basically the dimension of the photo. Okay. So the cool thing about this is, for instance, you got a response and you can actually edit the response as well. Okay. So you can create an other like another endpoint where you can edit the images. For instance, if you like to modify the image, you can give some additional prompts and it can actually modify the images for you as well. So you can actually create image variations and some cool things we will be seeing in the upcoming section of this course. So, okay. So to create this API, I'll just head towards my Visual Studio code where we used to create the other API as well, the completion if you remember, okay? <laughs> okay, I'm already inside my VS code and make sure that you are in the same folder like basic Azure functions in which you created two Azure apps like basic open AI and completion function right here, okay? So I can close this file out. Okay, so now what we'll do is actually we'll create a new Azure function, okay? So for that, you need to go to your Azure extension right here. So 
if I just open up my subscription here, yeah, I'll make sure that it's connected. So I'll just go to my workspace and here I'll just create a new function. So it should be HTTP trigger function and the function name will be called as image AI. I'll just press enter to confirm and it should be an anonymous function we already discussed these things uh, in the previous section as well so if i go to my explorer right here just minimize these all things and you can see right here that my image ai function has just been created successfully so that's a good sign so now what i'll do is i'll just copy everything from init.py of the completion function and i'll just paste it inside of my image ai okay because it would be pretty much same actually okay we just need to uh, like change some of the functions only okay and one more thing make sure that you have your own secret key my secret key will not work in this case so make sure that you get your secret key from your open ai's website you can like head over to this section right here view api keys and you can copy your one from here or you can just create a new one that's totally up to you okay so the first thing i need to modify here is that instead of calling open ai completion function i'll call open ai's image function okay okay inside the parameters of this image function so here's the few things i need so basically i will get rid of this model because open ai's image function knows what model to use so it's not required here actually okay so the prompt will be there prompt equals request body prompt so that's fine okay we need an n value as well that actually represents like how many images you want for a particular prompt so i'll just make it equal to request underscore body and i will give it a name as n okay we also need a size of the image so actually size means the dimension of the image if i come here and if i go back so you can see that size represents like 256 cross 256 512 cross 512 or 1024 cross 102 this is actually the size it's always recommended to read the official documentation before getting into this thing so that's really amazing okay so i'll just call this variable as size like this that's good there are a few more things that can come here but we do not want them right now actually we do not want to specify n or size it can work without it as well like you just put a prompt and it can just give you one photo with just a default size but it's always recommended like you should have the ability to actually generate multiple photos so that's really amazing okay so that's pretty much the part for the image create function so the main idea is here to actually format the response okay so that's important so if i go back to my documentation so you can see that my response is in the form of this thing okay so like created then there's data so first of all i'll need to get the data from the output variable so if i come back here output so i can just specify data here after coming inside of my data so you can see right here this is my data so inside my data there are like multiple urls okay so let's make it for now that i just need the first url of my photo i can just go to my vs code and just specify zero here so and i can just call here like url okay so what this thing does over here you can see right here i just open two windows side by side like this is my output variable that will just contain everything that this response has okay so from my output variable actually what i'm going to do is i'll just pick up my data this thing right here and then i will just specify the first instance of my data like this thing and then i'll just extract the url from that data that will be this thing right here okay i'll get this thing a key and a value all right all right all right that's really amazing you have just created your api so that's pretty much it for now one thing i need to specify here is that like unfortunately for now it will only give us the url of the first image okay which is actually pretty much fine in our use case which we are going to do in this section but if you're looking for multiple photos like 10 photos 15 photos or 20 photos in your application so what you need to do is you just want this complete thing like data like this thing you can see right here you will have to like 
uh, this whole thing, then you need to actually check for how many elements are there in that particular dictionary. And then you need a for loop to actually iterate and just extract all the URLs from that. That we are not going to see in this video. That's like out of the domain of this course. Okay. I'll just minimize this thing. Okay. This is our function. So now I will deploy my function to like on Microsoft Azure. So I'll go here. So I'll just click on this deploy button and deploy to function app. Yeah. It's saying like on open AI for seven, nine, which we created in the like second or third section, maybe of this course. So it's saying like, are you sure want to deploy? Yeah, obviously we want to deploy. So I'll click on deploy. Yeah, it's saying that deploying to open AI for seven, nine, check output window for status. I'll just click on output window to see whether it's going correctly or not, or if it has any errors, okay? All right, our deployment is complete. So now what I will do here is this is our image AI's URL you can see right here. So if I copy this URL and if I paste in browser, so it will most probably throw us an error like page not found because we haven't provided it with some prompt or something like that. Okay, this page isn't working. So I will go to my postman, which is our live saver and best friend to test APIs, you know, very well. Okay. Okay, here I am in my postman. So I'll go to my workspace and insert my API section. Actually, I do not need this test one thing. So I can just edit this thing. Like I can call it as image API. Okay, so I can just paste my URL right here like this URL, this one, or you can just go to your Azure subscriptions, function apps, then your workspace, function resource actually, okay? And inside of your functions, you can get your image AIs, you can copy the URL function from here as well, okay? So that would be the same actually, okay? So that's good. So now in the body, I'll just go to the raw one right here. So now what I'll do is I'll just come back to my VS code. Okay. So I have to provide these three things. Okay. I'll copy these three things, come back to my postman and I'll try to create a JSON format. So let's just convert it into JSON. Okay. These, yeah, I need a prompt. Okay. I need number of photos and I need size. Okay. So it should be wrapped around in double quotes, then a colon. Okay, I will copy a prompt like here, like 3D render of a cute tropical fish in an aquarium on a dark blue background digital art. Okay, so I want this image. I'll just uh, give a comma and I will just provide it with number of images. I'll call it as like I want one image. I have provided N1 because as the response will just receive the URL of the first image anyways, okay? So the size, I will just specify the size as, so it basically specifies some kind of format. So I'll call it as 1024 cross 1024. Okay, that's pretty much it. We have to provide only these three things. So that's good. First, I'll save this thing and then I'll just click on send button right here. So you can see that the communication has been started between OpenAI and our API. So it will probably bring back a response in a while. Yeah, you can see right here that it just provided me with a URL. I can copy this URL from here. It's really a huge URL. I just copy this thing. I'll come to a fresh tab here and I can just paste my URL right here. So let's see how our image looks like. So our prompt was 3D render of a cute tropical fish in an aquarium on a dark blue background. So let me try to open them side by side to compare to see whether our prompt is actually capable enough to represent our image okay or vice versa or our image is actually capable enough like be worthy enough to actually represent our prompt so it will take some time to load because the size is huge it's one or two four cross one or two four all right you can see that my image has already been loaded it's really a cool image actually okay it's basically a 3d render there's a cute tropical fish yeah, it doesn't seem like to be an aquarium, but yeah, it's a type of aquarium, you know. So on a dark blue background and it's a digital art. So awesome and amazing. You can see right here, it's already working and you can see how powerful is it. Like you can describe something 
and it will just generate for you whether it exists or not that's basically really cool and amazing okay so an other image that i will just want to create i'm just fancying something you can see a van gogh style painting of an american footballer or we can say football player i'll just click on send yeah it is communicating with open ai server so you can see right here that it just brought back a link if i just press control and click this link so it will open this link on another page you can already see the face so it's loading so it will take a while okay All right, you can see right here that how cool this painting looks. This actually looks a million dollar painting, okay? So the AI just generated for you in just providing a single prompt. So that's really amazing, okay? And I'll just try to give another prompt here to check whether it works or not. I'll say that a picture of Tom and Jerry being friends this would be actually really a rare picture so i'll just give it a size of 256 cross 256 so that it should load immediately or maybe quickly yeah you can see that it gave me an image right here so yeah you can see how cool this image looks this is a great image so that's actually great you can take your imagination to a new level using open ai's dolly okay so this ends our this video right here. So in the next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a front end application where you can actually can enter your prompts so that you can get back a response in the form of image. So all of this thing we will be doing in Power Apps. So that's it for now. I shall catch you up in the next video of this section. Stay blessed. Have a good day. Bye. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another project. So the topic of our today's project is, you know, ways to automate your daily tasks using Python. So yeah, in this particular video, we'll be discussing about file management projects. So let's just say uh, you're given a certain files which contain like TXT, JPG, like images text files you know a lot of different files so now uh you know with the help of this simple script of python code you can arrange those files and you can move those files to the respective folders so you know that way you don't have to do a lot of work you can simply you know run that code and that particular line of code or script of code will help you personalize those files for you in the respective folder so yeah that's how easy it is so yeah now let's just go ahead and see the code for that all right so this is the script of code for that so first of all we need to import few button libraries so we have os and shuttle so the os module provides a way of interacting with the operating system you know including working with file paths and directories so whenever you are putting like file paths and directories so os library is always important and shuttle so shuttle module, you know, allows file operations such as moving files. So if you're moving files, so you need to use the shuttle library. Then we have defined organize files, a function in which we have taken directory as parameter. So uh, then we'll basically map file extensions to folder name, which has txt to text file. So, well, you know, whenever you have like txt files, so obviously whenever you have a file, so that contains .txt. So that basically tells us like what the format of that file is. So if we have txt file, it will be moved to the txt files folder so jpg the file will be images png will also be images and pdf will be in the pdf folder so yeah uh then the next step is you know you'll be looping through files in the directory so for that we have applied for loop because obviously you know in these type of cases whenever you are going through stuff you're going through files so you have to apply loop and for that for loop is always really really important okay so the loop will iterate through each file in the specified directory and then in that we'll check if the file if the item is a file so that's why we have applied if statements so you know you can see the os.path.is file right over here function you know checks if the item you know uh, at the given path is a file so this will check you know whether it is a file or not so let's just say if, it, if that is a file so it will be moved to a respective folder otherwise it will remain over there okay and next uh, dot extension with this will basically extract the file extension and the next step we have if again so this will basically check extension and it will move the file so let's just say if the file extension ma matches one in the mapping so it determines the des destination folder based on the extension okay so that's what it's going to do and then uh this if statement right over here will basically check if uh creating destination folder if this does not exist so this if statement will check that and then we have basically shuttle library that is applied right over here. So this will help basically to move the file to the destination folder as I told you right over here, right? 
So yeah, uh, then we at the last we have a statement. So this will basically just help us for our main function. And yeah, at the last, uh, it will organize files and it will be targeted to the respective directory. Okay, so yeah, now let's just go ahead and run this code. So yeah, uh, over here, you can see we have to apply our file path, you know, like the folder where we're going to be organizing the files. Okay, so in my case, let me show you the guys the folder. All right, so this is basically the folder where I'll be working on. So in this, you can see we I have like two images, I have a txt file and I have a PDF file, right? So let me just go ahead and copy the location of this folder, come back to my Visual Studio code and paste it right over here, as you guys can see, okay? All right, so it's already done. So now I'm just going to go ahead and press F5 to run this particular code. All right, yeah, so as you guys can see, showing like uh, the sunflower from slides is, is has been moved to the images folder as well as this and the txt file has moved to the text files folder and, you know, the PDF has been moved to the PDF folder. So now if you can go ahead and go to our, you know, that particular folder, which was this, so as you guys can see now, it's all aligned to its respective folder. So now it's very organized, right? So I can simply open my images folder. I can see I have images in that. I can open my PDFs folder. I have PDF in that. And now I can open my text file folder and I have text files in that. So now it's really reorganized and it's really easy for me uh, to, you know, just open it and access the files right away. So this is how basically, you know, these mini projects can really automate your daily life tasks and it can really make your lives easier, like without any problems. So yeah, I hope you like this video and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another video of this amazing project, which is ways to automate your daily tasks using Python. So yeah, uh, this will be our second way. So in this video, we'll talk about task scheduling. So yeah, uh, as you guys know, like Python can be used for scheduling tasks as well. Uh, you can now use Python built-in scheduling module to schedule tasks such as backups, data imports, and other tasks, you know, that you need to run on a regular basis. Uh, so, you know, let's just say uh, you work a 9-to-5 job and need to schedule some of your tasks, so, you know, so that you can remember those. So, now with the help of Python and a simple script of code, you can do that very, very easily. So, in this video, we'll actually be seeing that exactly. So, yeah, without further ado, let's just get started. All right, so this will be uh, the Python script for that. So, first of all, uh, you need to import some of the important libraries which are import schedule, import type, and from daytime, import daytime, okay? So yeah, we basically import the schedule module for task scheduling. So obviously this is important for task scheduling. And if you talk about time, so import time is really important for managing time. And from daytime to import time, this is, so this particular library is used, or you can say module, to handle date and time operation, okay? So that's why we have taken these three important libraries. And then we have basically dictionary to store tasks and their due dates. So this empty brackets right over here. So we basically created an empty dictionary that will help you to store task names and their due dates. Okay. So then we have defined a schedule task function. So this function will basically prompt the user to input a task name and a due date in a specific formats, which will be this year's year, month, month, day, date, hour, minute, minute. Okay. And then uh, we have basically try function. So, you know, if then uh, tries to convert the input due date string to a daytime object handling any format related errors. So for that, we have taken try and accept value error, right? So in case we have any error, you know, the format isn't right or, you know, anything can happen. So it will, you know, instantly print invalid date format. Please use this format, okay? So for that, we have try and accept. So this is really, really important. Then we have another function, which is view task function. So this function basically will display the scheduled task and their due dates. So let's just say now you have inputted the function and now you want to see your task which is scheduled, right? So for that, we have applied this function over here. So it will check if there are no tasks and it will print a message accordingly, okay? So let's just say if there are tasks, so it will iterate through the task, which you can see right over here, and uh, it will print each task along with its due date, okay? So that's what this whole function is gonna do. Then we have sample task for demonstration. So, you know, this is just a sample task. Then we have the while loop. So this while loop is basically menu and user interaction, okay? So this code uh, will display a menu and it will allow the user to interact with the program, you know, by choosing options such as scheduling a task, view task, or exit. So every time you will run a code, it will give you like two, three options, which will be schedule a task, view schedule a task, and exit. So, so this project will have these three options, right? So either you can schedule a task, either you can go through your schedule type, which has already been scheduled, or either you can exit, okay? And last, it will ask you to enter your choice, you know, between these three, okay? So yeah, it's say if choice is equal, equal to one, so it will schedule a task, you know, then we have the options LZIP, LZIP, and 
else it will print invalid choice if is you don't put any of the options between these okay so then we have bulk true then at the end it will run right away so yeah now let's just go ahead and try to run this code and see uh what happens like how it's gonna work all right so as you guys can see first of all it's asking me to enter your choice either i can schedule a task either i can view my schedule task or either i can exit let's just say i want to schedule a task so i'll hit one oops i'll hit one over here so it's asking me to enter the task name. Let me just remove this first of all. Enter task name. So let's just say my task name is, uh, let's just go for Usman, my name, okay? And enter due date. Uh, let's just say my due date for uh, this task is 2023. Then the month is going to be, let's just say October is the month. And I want that to schedule for 23rd October. And hour, hour, minute, minute, let's just say I want that uh, for 8 p.m., okay? So I'll do like 20 colon zero, zero. I'll hit enter. Okay, so you're saying the task has been scheduled successfully. So now it's asking me again to enter my choice. Let's just say I want to view my task that has already been scheduled, okay? So I'll say view task. So it's saying, okay, so these are basically the previous tasks that I did, you know, just to check this code. So... No matter you like close this tab, you open it again. So it doesn't matter what happens. So this task will be saved into your code like forever. Okay. So like, let's just say you do it for fun or whatever you do. So you, whatever tasks you're going to store in that. So these will remain in that no matter what. Okay. So that is basically a very good functionality uh, of this Python script if you ask me. So yeah, uh, this is how basically our task scheduling project is going to work. So yeah, I hope you like this video and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another video. So in this video, we'll actually be seeing a simple Python script for converting our JPG images to PNG images. All right. All right. So this script of Python code can be really useful in a lot of scenarios. So let's just say you are working in, uh, you know, video editor company. So you edit videos and you know, this is your job, right? So a lot of times like JPG images aren't supported in a lot of editors, right? So you need to convert that to PNG. So now with the help of our simple Python code, we can easily convert our JPG images to PNG images like in just one click. Okay, so it's really, really simple. So let's just see how we can do that. So yeah. Uh, this will be uh, the code for that. So first of all, you need to import some necessary modules or libraries. You need to import OS, which is used for file and directory operations, as you guys, as you guys all know. And then we have PIL import image. So PIL, uh, it's basically a Python imaging library, which is used for working with images, right? So let's just say working with images, you are converting them, you are making them, you know, uh, more and more accessible and you know you're pixelating them even as well so for that PIL uh, is really really important okay so now next step is basically you need to define a list of input JPG image file names and uh, uh, you can customize the list to include the file names the JPG images you want to convert so you know this is this will basically be the file that you want to convert from JPG because you can see it's JPG first of all to PNG all right so this will be your file. And then we have applied loop, for loop over here through each image in the images list. So this loop iterates over each image file specified in the image list. So this is gonna do that. Then uh, we're gonna split the file name and extension. As you guys can see, we have split variable over here now. So yeah, uh, this will basically split the file name from the extension. For example, in file is input.jpg, f will contain input and e will contain jpg, okay? So this will basically, you know, so every JPG image, as you can see right over here, is basically dot JPG, okay? The image name dot JPG. So this split variable right over here will split these into like separate and dot JPG separate, okay? So that we can change that to PNG right away, okay? So this is how it works. So then we have a statement to check if the input and output file names are different, you know, uh, because our a new file will be in PNG. And then we have try and XM variable as well, okay? So now let's just go ahead and run this code and how it's going to work. So for, for that, first of all, you need to input your picture to this uh, folder, okay? Like the folder they're working on. Let's just say uh, I want to convert this image. This is images, as you can see, it's a JPG image. So I want to convert this image uh, to PNG. So I'll just drag that to my folder over here. So as you guys can see, JPG right over here. And I can simply, you know, just take the name of this go to rename, copy this name with control C and paste it over here, like right over here, okay? 
All right, it's all done now. So now let me just go ahead and press F5 to run this code. All right, yeah, so as you guys can see, showing conversion successful uh, converted to uh, PNG files. And you can see right over here as well, now we have two images. So first one is JPG images, and now we have the exact same version of PNG image, right? So it's really, really good. So now with the help of just a few seconds, it's that converted at jpg image to png and now we can use that anywhere without any problem okay so yeah i hope you like this video and i'll see you in the next one until then take care bye bye hey guys what's up welcome back to another video so in this video we'll actually be seeing a simple python script through which you can basically convert your pdf files to your audio files okay so let's just say you're given a pdf file and you need to convert that to a readable audio file where you can you know easily understand and where you can easily write that and use that you know for uh, different purposes so how we can do that let's just see okay so this will be uh the line of code for that so first of all need to import the required libraries first one we have is p uh pi pdf2 so this is used to handle pdf files so really easy then we have gtts import gts okay so it's basically google text to speech you know it's used to convert text to speech so this will basically bring uh, all the access from google text to speech so because we obviously the PDF file we need to convert to audio files, so it should be like some kind of a text speech, okay? So that's why we have taken help from Google, and then of course the OS, and the first step is that I've actually provided all of you guys the comments, you know, so that is, it might be easy for you to understand. So first step is to replace a file.pdf with a path to a PDF file. So it, it is basically there to specify your PDF file location. So you know, whatever you're gonna put over here will be your file that you'll be working on and that you need to convert to an audio file. Then the next step is to initialize a PDF reader. So for that, we have initialized a PDF reader. Then the third step is to create a directory for audio files. So you know, this will create a directory called audio output for storing the generated audio files. So as you guys can see over here, um, the exist OK is equal to true. This is basically an argument, you know, that ensures that it won't raise an error if the directory already exists, OK? So then we'll iterate the loop over here. So the loop iterates through each page of the PDF. So it will keep on running into the pages, you know, just for the better and better text-to-speech conversation. And then uh, we have to create a GTS object for a text-to-speech conversion, as I told you guys. Then it will save the audio as an MP3 file. So whatever text-to-speech is going to generate, it will save us the audio file for us in our folder. And then it will print the file by the generated audio. So let's just say our task is completed. So it will print yeah, that audio file has been saved. So yeah, uh, now let's just go ahead and run this code. And for and for this code, I have choose uh, the PDF as this PDF right here. You can see uh, prompt engineering for developers. So this is the PDF file that I chose for this video. This is basically a prompt engineering course description. I want my uh, code to read this whole to me in a proper audio file. So I pasted it right over here and in the code as well, you can see I have provided a file location for that as well. So now let's just go ahead and run this code and see what happens. All right, so as you guys can see right over here is showing like the audio file has been saved. It has then it is like audio output page read on MP3, you know, and we have basically for page one, page two, and page three, because we have three pages in our PDF, as you guys can see. So yeah, uh, these are basically the audio outputs. So as you guys can see right over here, we have the audio output for page one. We can still simply play this. Very cool. Description. Real world insights to the engineering page. And then for the page two, we can add run this as well. Same goes for page three and the page four, okay? So yeah, uh, this is basically a very useful project. You can simply use that in so many scenarios. And yeah, so that was it for this video. I'll see you on the next one. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another video. See, so in this video, we'll actually be seeing a simple Python script of how to clean your computer. So let's just say, uh, you know, your computer desktop or Windows desktop looks like this, like which is a lot of, it is very messy. You know, it has a lot of, things that we don't need to be here. So if your Windows desktop looks like this, you can now simply rearrange all those to their respective folders by simply one uh, click by using this Python script. It's really, really that simple. So yeah, let's just discuss what it is, uh, how we can use that and how it performs. So yeah, first of all, you need to import some of the important libraries as well. So we have OS shuttle and get pass. So OS is used for file and directory operation, as you guys all know. Then we have shuttle, this is used for moving files. So obviously, uh, if you want to arrange anything, you have to move files in order to, you know, get your desktop more and more cleaner. And then we have get pass. 
So get pass is basically used to obtain the current user's uh, username. Okay, so obviously we'll be working in desktop, so we'll have its directory and everything. So that's why we have used get pass. Then the next step is to uh, to get the current user's username. For that we have taken that. Then the third step is to define source and destination directories. So for that, we have taken source directory as this. This is my desktop directory. And then we have defined the destination directory where the files will be organized, okay? And then we have defined the destination, you know? We'll basically create a folder in desktop, name as everything, and you know, we'll basically just put all the random and, you know, extra files into that folder so that your desktop should look clean. So then we'll basically, uh, the fifth uh, step is to check if the destination directory already exists so if it already exists it will create that it will basically create another one with one two three you know if the directory name everything is already there so it will change that to one two three and stuff like that and then after that it will create the destination directory which i just told you guys so this line will basically uh, create destination directory where files will be organized so the next step is to list files and directories on the desktop so it will create a list of files and directories on your desktop then it will iterate through the loop and the loop will iterate through each file and directory on your desktop and it will construct full source path and skip script files. So, you know, it will construct uh, the full source path for the current item. It will check as well, like if the item is script file itself, the script, you know, that's currently running. Then it will skip it to, pre uh, to prevent moving the script, okay? So yeah, and then it will check if it's a file and move it. So if the item is file, not a directory, it moves the file to a destination directory. And at the end, it will print like the files on a desktop is not moved to the, like whatever folder it is, okay? So yeah, uh, this could basically organizes files on your desktop by moving them into a new directory or, you know, a number version of that directory of it, which if, if, if that already exists. So it, ensures, so it ensures that the script itself is not moved and it provides a message with the task is completed, okay? So yeah, now let's just go ahead and run this code. Okay, so currently our desktop is looking like this, right? So now if I run this code, I'll hit press five. So it's showing like the files on the desktop and move to uh, everything three because I already uh, run this code like twice. So if I go to my desktop now, now look at this, like how cool it is, like how beautiful it's looking and everything which was on my desktop as it moved to this folder, okay? So if I do it like manually, it would like take me a lot of time because obviously all the files are mixed and I'm not sure like, you know, if what files to put in a folder and what to leave on desktop. So it is a really smart script of code, which it did, you know, it put, uh, it moved all my files into one folder and my now my desktop is looking like this clean. So this is really, really good.